来るんですか Okay, thank you. Good morning. Good morning to all the folks here in attendance at the Thyra Thompson State Office Building, and good morning to committee members and to those who are watching online. Please call this meeting of the Joint Revenue Committee to order and have first order businesses to call the roll. Ms. Wanglin, if you'd pre please. Senator Baldwin? Here. Senator James? Here. Senator Pappas? Here. Senator Schuler? Here. Representative Baker? Here. Representative Gray? Here. Representative Hallinan? Here. Representative Henderson? Here. Representative Jennings? Here. Representative Roscoe? Here. Representative Sweeney? Here. Representative Yin? Here. Co Chairman Case? Present. Chairman Harshman? Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate everybody here and, uh, and all the work and the working groups that have gotten to this point. And uh, look forward to a couple days of, of good work by this committee. Any opening comments, Mr. Co-Chair? Do you have any? I don't have any, so we'll get right to work. Our first uh, item on our agenda is uh, K-12 education revenue. We uh, basically solicited proposals, ideas to try to think outside the box or new things for Wyoming. So uh, with that, um, staff, I'd ask you, we had several proposals. Maybe you wanna, you wanna run through those with us, Josh, and then, and uh, just summarize those for us. And then folks have all gotten electronic copies. And then I believe we have some folks here maybe that wanna talk about theirs a little bit. So go ahead. Mr. Sure Anderson. thing, Mr. Chairman, I'll just run through. I handed out this document of a, a kind of a summary of proposals. There are, um, there is a longer document for anyone that's interested in, in more detail on these. Um, I'll just go quickly down through here. Uh, number one was from uh, Ray Peterson. Um, he uh, recommended, uh, rather than a revenue proposal, um, uh, cutting um, education funding in a, in a number of ways or, or reducing um, reducing the automatic increase, reducing the amount of cash reserves, and, um, and I think all of his other proposals were kind of related to those, those uh, cash reserves. Uh, number two was from uh, Roxy Taft. Um, this was to um, rem remove the uh, foundation program cap of 100 million and also review the timing of collections. Um, and uh, just to kind of flow uh, money to the schools. Uh, sure thing, Mr. Chairman. Sorry about that. Um, also, um, a collection of uh, taxes in the case of bankruptcy and uh, to reinstate the mill levy for uh, maintenance on a statewide level. Um, option three from Garvin Durant. Uh, this was to um, reduce uh, pay for administrators. Um, I believe that's the, the scope of that recommendation. Number four, um, Robert Jensen. And again, some of these people are here, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sure they will um, want to give more detail on their proposals. Um, this would be um, after looking at um, reducing spending. Um, after that is completed, then this recommendation would be to um, increase the residential property tax rate um, from 9.5% to 11.5%, the assessment rate. Number five, Penny Vance. Um, this is one of a number of uh, recommendations that would be to um, fund uh, solar installations at school facilities to increase energy efficiency. Uh, number six, Madeline Darylimple. Again, is one uh, related to solar panels. 
same, same with Anna Egging um, and Dudley Case. Um, what's that? <laughs> and um, also, uh, that recommendation would also be to uh, in, install uh, LED lighting. Um, number nine, Sue Peters again, um, installation of solar panels, as well as Chris uh, Corfanta. Um, it also would in, uh, in recommend a, a penny tax for schools. Number 11 is Maria Catherman. Um, again, uh, this was the idea of adding solar panels. Same with number 12, Michelle Irwin. Number 13, again, uh, was the uh, recommendation of um, solar panels. Um, number 14, again, I think um, was also related to this idea of uh, installing solar panels. Number 15, um, Claire Johnson. Um, this would be a, a proposal for the state to enter into agreements to lease state land, uh, school trust lands, um, uh, to a Wyoming-based entity to um, ensure that all tax revenue stays in Wyoming. Um, that would allow uh, construction and operation of a gaming facility. Um, the entity would be required to have 10 years of operating class three gaming facilities and um, provide that 75% or revenue would go back to uh, Wyoming. Um, so that's kind of the, the summary, Mr. Chairman. I take any questions. And like I said, I think some of these people are here that could provide more detail on. Okay, very good. Thank you for that summary and putting this together. I'll just start working down the list kind of uh, from 1 through 15, several of those are kind of related. Um, I'll just go, is anybody here to talk about the solar panel installation? Is anybody here to talk about Mr. That? Chairman? Yes. We have Michelle Irwin from the Powder River Basin Resource Council online. Okay. Why don't you uh, go ahead and bring her into the meeting there. Good morning. Can you hear us? Good morning. I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Go ahead. Thanks for your proposal. Are you going to kind of speak for everybody, I'm assuming, kind of on this? And it's similar proposal. And so the floor is yours. Why don't you take a few minutes and tell us what you're thinking? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. And thank you for addressing this important topic in your interim um, and being open to solutions. So recent federal legislation, but especially the Inflation Reduction Act or IRA, offers an opportunity to help schools save money by investing in energy efficient infrastructure. The IRA expands existing federal tax credits for renewable energy to states and schools for projects placed into service after December 31st of this year, or that have become, begun construction before 2034. There are also incentives for energy communities, brownfield use, and meeting prevailing wages. All of these are tools our energy communities could utilize. Details from the Treasury are forthcoming, but in the meantime, an audit of current utility costs for schools, um, as well as coordination of the state to centralize these efforts so that we could leverage various funding avenues and partner with others would be helpful. Um, I do have some more information if you have any specific questions, um, but I don't want to go into too much detail without that. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you for joining us. Any questions of Ms. Irwin? Okay, I, I think uh, you said you had some more information. Maybe you could just email that to us and send that to us, and uh, we'd sure appreciate that. And as we learn more, I believe that was signed into law yesterday. Um, 
So as we learn, maybe there are some opportunities there we can investigate over the coming weeks. So appreciate any questions. I think uh, Representative Sweeney has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in the proposal, as far as uh, solar panels, I think that's a fine idea for our schools, but um, what, what would we do? Obviously the sun doesn't always shine later at night um, and the battery storage capacity of those to fuel some of our larger um, uh, schools. We're sitting <clears throat> here in Casper across from uh, Nantatrona County High School. Um, and w what, is, what are your proposals for base load? Go ahead, Ms. Irwin. So that's a bit beyond my scope, um, but I just will emphasize that these opportunities are not just for solar and that by doing an energy audit, you could identify various things, but there are other resources besides solar. There's also wind and the battery backup um, efforts, but the EPA Energy Star program for schools um, identifies that probably 30% of energy costs are from inefficiency. So these um, infrastructure funding for energy um, efficiencies are also things that can be addressed in an audit so that, you know, um, just being using better use of what we have um, can sometimes be all that's needed. Okay, very good. Well, we look forward to some further information you can send to us. And I know, you know, other state agencies, I know uh, YDOT a few years back underwent uh, under the former director and, you know, with just the lighting across the state that they light up intersections all across the state. And it's, it was a significant amount of money that uh, has been saved in energy costs. But so we appreciate you bringing this to us and uh, look forward to some more information as we kind of investigate this over the next couple of weeks. Appreciate it. Okay. Is there anyone else online? We, okay. And so there were some folks who talked about cuts. Any of those folks here that, okay. And there were a couple, is there anybody here? There was a couple proposals on cuts and then there were a couple on revenue increases, you know, on the two mills that went away. We're actually paying the fewest mills now in modern state history with school capital construction and maintenance mills that have gone away. Nobody here to talk about that. Okay, so how about uh, Northern Arapaho tribe? Are you guys, boy, what, that'd be great. I appreciate you. If you guys would like to share with us your idea. Councilman Bastors. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see both of you. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Just for the committee's benefit and the public, if you could just introduce yourself and who you represent. Sure. Uh, good morning, Chairman Harshman, Chairman Case, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Stephen Fasthorse. I am the co-chairman of the Northern Rapho Business Council. Uh, the governmental body for the Northern Rapo tribe. Uh, I would like to thank the chairs and the committee, you know, of the com for allowing me to discuss our proposal that was submitted in response to joint committee's call for proposals that would provide sustainable long-term revenue sources for K through 12 education. The Northern Rapo tribe proposes the committee consider legislation that would allow the state to enter into a specific agreement or arrangement to lease state-owned trust lands to a Wyoming-owned and based entity that will ensure 100% of tax revenue stay in Wyoming. The specific arrangement would allow carefully targeted construction and operation of class three gaming facilities on school trust lands and facilities that would be regulated by the Wyoming Gaming Commission. 
the entity must have a minimum of 10 years operating and regulating multiple class three gaming facilities in Wyoming and must engage in a revenue sharing agreement with the state of Wyoming and ensure 75% or more of the state revenues of the state of, of the net revenues goes to individuals and entities located within the state of Wyoming. All state revenue sharing agreements as well as the school trust land lease payments would benefit state K through 12 funding accounts. To assess the potential of this type of agreement, we respectfully request further dialogue with the committee about how this proposal could work and the potential revenue the state could receive and why it would be beneficial to Wyomingites. We believe a relationship between the state and the Northern Rapo tribe would have the potential to raise a significant amount of revenue for K through 12 education while simultaneously increasing the amount of money cycling through Wyoming's economy. Specifically, this proposal will assist in accomplishing the committee's second priority of raising $50 million annually for K through 12 education. Authorizing the state to enter into a specific agreement to lease state-owned school trust lands to a Wyoming-owned and based entity will result in Wyoming receiving the most bang for their state trust land buck. Our proposal would result in at least four major wins. First, the revenue of leasing the school trust lands will go directly to K through 12 education. Second, a portion of the gaming revenue generated would provide further economic benefit to K through 12 education. Third, uh, carefully constructed gaming facilities would provide positive indirect economic impact to local communities where they are located. Last, having an experienced entity like the Northern Rapo tribe lease the land and operate the facilities would ensure net profits would remain in Wyoming and be used for tribal services. We have no doubt these funds will be circulated throughout Fremont County and the entire state, given an additional economic impact for Wyoming. This targeted approach would allow the state to carefully authorize and limited right-sized amount of gaming. We are ready to engage with the committee to determine the most appropriate path to achieve significant funding for K through 12 education while ensuring profits remain in Wyoming. Thank you for considering our proposal. And now we, we're open to take questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. And uh, members of the committee, any questions for Chairman Fasthorse? Go ahead, Representative Yen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Co-Chairman Fasthorse, so, School trust lands is kind of a touchy topic in Teton County. I'm curious on whether you had any ideas of, of where such a facility would be placed. Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chairman. Uh, Chairman uh, Harshman, uh, thank you, Representative Ian. Um, again, that's, that's why we would um, ask if we could uh, have, have uh, more time to discuss the proposal with the committee. Um, because we 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 don't have that determination, you know, but we would like to engage in where that possibly could be. Okay, very good, Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Co-Chairman Fasthorse. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned a qualification of ten years for a uh, Wyoming-owned and based entity to operate this uh, proposed facility. How many of those are there in the state currently? Go ahead, Chairman. Okay, Chairman Harshman. Uh, thank you, Representative Baker. Uh, right now, we I believe we are the only, and I believe there's one other, which would be the Eastern Shoshone. 
that has more than 10 years? Uh, good morning, I'm the in-house counsel for the Northern Arapaho Tribe, Claire Johnson. Uh, right now for the operation of class three gaming, the only class three gaming that exists in the state of Wyoming is operated by the Northern Arapaho and the Eastern Shoshone Tribe. And now with the online sports betting, there are those vendors, but they wouldn't meet the 10 year requirement. Okay, very good, thank you. Any follow up? Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just for clarification, does do both tribes meet the 10 year qualification right now? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Johnson, do you want to answer that? Or? Uh, Chairman Harshman, I would have to check the date on when Eastern Shoshone entered their compact with the state of Wyoming. I do believe it's been 10 years, but I'd like to confirm that. Okay, very good. The good co chairman's nodding, yes, but, or right. maybe. Go, Mr. Co chairman. Maybe can add some clarity. To that. It's a it's a strong maybe. I, I'm pretty sure that it's been. I would I would bet the farm, but it'd be a small farm. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Representative Baker, any follow ups? Okay, Representative Sweeney has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, thank you, Co Chairman Fast Horse. Um, I I think it's uh, excellent in. Uh, really thought-provoking proposal uh, by the Northern Rapo. Um, and uh, so in digging down a little deeper, because I had some interest, uh, former property I had here in Casper, mm -hmm. was trying to engage uh, in, in kind of that same thought process without the education uh, formula that you've provided. But I ran into roadblocks um, basically with the federal legislation, um, and I can't remember the years that some of this was prescribed, but um, I was looking more so as some sort of an exchange um, in an operation, but have you looked into that on the possibility? Because this would be uh, off the reservation mm -hmm. um, and uh, a state parcel um, is, is intriguing. Um, would, do you believe uh, in your research that that automatically qualifies if we go, go down this road? Uh, on a state parcel. I'll let my okay. attorney answer. You want to, oh, I, okay, go ahead, Johnson. Uh, Chairman, uh, so the question with that is, the tribe's proposal, we're actually not looking to take land into trust and operate under IGRA. We're actually asking to be a vendor in the state of Wyoming and to have the legislature you know, address this and make it so we can participate the same way any other citizen would, you know, the Northern Arapaho tribe are citizens of the state of Wyoming. They want to work with you all as a vendor with revenue going directly to the state in an off reservation gaming venture. So just to, so if I can summarize what I heard then, so this wouldn't be tribal lands, this would be just leased. You're not looking to transfer state school trust lands and make them tribal trust lands. It's just to simply lease those state lands and pay the state like any uh, lessor does with the, with the, that leases state lands, like from cattle to truck stops to whatever it might be. Yeah, okay, very correct. Good. Okay. So, uh, Representative Sweeney has a follow up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, just to follow up on that, do you do you believe that that's allow allowable under the federal guidance? Um, do you think that we'd run into problems with that, um, with either either vendor um, being allowed to set up, or would their need to be some state um, rules or regulations changed or in order to allow that? 
Yes, this would this would be, excuse me, Chairman Hirschman, Representative Sweeney, this would all be under state law. This wouldn't be federal. Uh, on trust land, you operate under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which does have federal requirements, but this is more of a state's rights issue. This is the state of Wyoming deciding what they want to allow in the state. And if they choose to allow the tribe to act as a vendor, that would be your state law that needs to change to adjust to that. Okay. Okay, so you're just simply, I mean, again, you would be a, a lessee just, just like any other, and you would approach the state land board like any other. And, uh, okay, where, if I could just, um, I mean, where did you, are there other states, or where did you get this idea? Are there other states that have done this, or? Uh, Chairman Harshman, there are currently 31 states that have Indian gaming of some kind within the state. States such as Oklahoma, Arizona, Idaho, and Minnesota allowed their gaming to be done exclusively by Indian tribes. Uh, Indian gaming last year uh, produced a revenue of $39 billion across the United States. Uh, using the state of Oklahoma, for example, their class three gaming is only operated by the 39 tribes in the state of Oklahoma. In 2016, they saw a total economic impact of $7.2 billion in the state of Oklahoma from Indian gaming. So just, and then you went kind of, so there, there were like three, four, five that were just, I, there was 31 total, but then there were three. 31 total, um, just off the top of my head, ones that exclusively use uh, Indian tribes to operate class three gaming, Oklahoma, Arizona, Minnesota, and Idaho are some examples of that. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair. Just Trent, how many of those are uh, off reservation facilities? I mean, that, that's kind of the, I think the, the gist of his question. And, and I remember, you know, re, uh, years back, there was proposals to uh, uh, take some land out by the new airport, by Denver, and, and uh, but but that involved tribal ownership, I believe, was the plan. This this is, of course, uh, state land. So, uh, how many other states use this kind of model? So, for off reservation gambling run by the tribes. Uh, Chairman, co-chairman, I'd have to do a little bit more research on that. I know in states such as Oklahoma, most of the time when the tribes want to put up a new casino, uh, like that, that's our is they purchase land and then they own the land themselves. So I'd have to look to see if other states do this. This might be a unique and new model, but it actually works most to the benefit of the state. Not only would the state of Wyoming be deriving tax revenue and a revenue share, they'd be getting lease revenue off leasing the parcels. Yeah. Okay, again, just being a, uh, a lessee and just like others in the state. Very good. Okay, I think Senator Papp is waiting patiently for a question right here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, my question is uh, on that uh, ten-year requirement. Uh, how is that number developed, and um, what pitfalls do you see if that was a, a shorter number? Or, uh, I mean, wh why why the ten years? Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Mr. Co-Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chairman Harshman and uh, Senator Pappas. Um, again, the the ten year operating and regulating multiple class three. Um, that's one sentence. You know, we want to we wanted to ensure that that was two that that was a two part sentence. Again, it's a ten year requirement plus multiple uh, class three operating. Because again, sir, um, we we have been the the first and the original operators of class three. The first. In, in Wyoming to have operated and probably we have the longest history of operating class three gaming in Wyoming. And so again, um, it's just the fact that we have been your longest tenured, uh, you know, uh, option for professional uh, class three gaming. Very good. Any other questions here? I've been working the right side down here. Uh, Representative Sweeney. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, it, it, very, very intriguing and um, of great interest to me um, as a really good source of possible revenue. Um, so 
how might this work, um, let's say, in Hot Springs State Park in Thermopolis? Uh, if that became an option, um, how, how might that, that look if this all came to fruition? Um, okay, Mr. Co-Chairman. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chairman, and again, uh, thank you, Representative Sweeney. Again, that's that's why we would like to um, have a continuation of discussions with you all, because then we could specifically, you know, get get into the the deeper dive of possible locations and and give you a better analysis. Because right now, again, we don't want to get in too too deep to any of those type of discussions until we've had enough time to actually uh, explore that more. Okay, thank you. Representative Baker has a question. Thank you, and, and um, Mr. Co-Chairman, uh, you can just be general, but my question is, you had mentioned the revenue sharing aspect and, and dedicating a portion of that revenue to the tribes. Is it your expectation that the revenue from these facilities would be used strictly for tribal K-12 expenses? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chairman. Chairman, thank you. And again, Representative Baker, um, the, the model that we propose would would not be specifically for our K through 12 on the reservation. It would be for, again, in general, the state's K through 12 for, for again, all the counties across the, the state of Wyoming. So I'll just say this again, so as, so I understand. So as a lessee of a state school trust land, be like any, those revenues would go right into the school foundation program. It's my understanding then. That's what you're saying, okay? Yes. Very good. Okay. Any other questions then? And I guess you could say part of that would flow back to reservation schools based on the model but they would flow to Rock Springs and Green River and Lander and Casper and Cheyenne and everywhere mm -hmm. out of mm -hmm. the state. The, the Toronto would probably get a little share. About 13.5% or whatever. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think your share is about 4%. <laughs> so, Sweetwater thank, County a little higher. Okay, Representative Sweeney. So just to uh, follow up to you, Mr. Co-Chairman, um, so you keep mentioning school school trust lands would this not apply to um all all of uh sections of state land and how how does that fit like let's say hot springs state park is that necessarily a school section i i think um mr co-chairman wants to address that and i'll certainly follow up with what I think I know from what I'm reading in this proposal. Okay. Um, every section of land uh, when, upon our uh, transfer to statehood, we received uh, we, two sections and, and some of those are designated as state trust lands and the revenue for those go to um, the schools. That is the bulk of our lands, but it's not all of our lands. And actually there are trust lands for other purposes than the schools. There's some institutional land, and then there's outright state land. As I understand this proposal so far, it's with respect to those trust lands that do benefit the schools. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because it keeps uh, kind of the high road of where the revenues go. And, and uh, I think everybody can support that. It is possible to take lands and exchange them from one place to another so that they can be trust lands even though they were formerly something else, or it'd be possible to pursue revenue streams that would support um, more general things than the schools, and then you wouldn't have to change the status of the land. But I think you'll find when you look at these trust lands that there's some in very desirable locations in different places, and I'm not picking on Teton County because I know that I think that's an impossible development. But uh, um, that's kind of the art of the possible, I think. Maybe I could ask uh, if our staff knows that, you know, on the, we've lost about a million acres since statehood we've sold off and traded, but of, of these trust lands, as a good co-chairman talks, some are universities, some are for the state mental hospital, some are for the miners hospital, et cetera. 
what is it what's the percentage that are k-12 trust lands i used to it's do you know that dean i think it's a it's a significant amount it's well over 70 percent but. thank you just uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman Harshman, I believe that percentage, it's, a, it's just over 80%, yeah. roughly five-sixths, which would be about 83% of, of the state lands are, are, the, are the school trust lands. So that's ballpark rule yeah, of thumb. Very good. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, Senator Schuler has a question. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, just a question, a quick question. You talked a lot about some other states, uh, particularly Oklahoma. I'm kind of interested. I don't know if you know much about their state, how they're set up. Um, do, you, do you have much information on their their model in terms of their business model and how they've dealt with that? Because it seems like they've they've created quite a bit of revenue from theirs. So thank you. Okay, Mr. Co-Chairman, Fast Horse, go ahead. Uh, Chairman Harshman, and again, uh, Senator Schuler. I'm going to defer to our, our in-house attorney because she is from Oklahoma. Very good, Ms. Johnson. <laughs> uh, Chairman and Senator Schuler. Um, so the state of Oklahoma actually uses a compact. Um, the state legislator has created a model compact that tribes enter into with the state that has a set revenue percentage sharing. Uh, there are 39 tribes in the state of Oklahoma, and I'm not sure on the number that actually engage in Indian gaming, but the state of Oklahoma has 150 Indian casinos. Um, for a very a small population state compared to the rest of the country, that's a significant number of, of casinos. But with each case of the compact, the state approves. The, the tribes have to say where they're going to initiate the gaming, under what circumstances. So it's very much a give and take between the tribes and the state working together to come up with the solution that, that works for the benefit of everyone within the state of Oklahoma. Okay, any other further questions? Mr. Co-Chairman? Well, I, th I think um, I'd like to thank the Arapaho Business Council for bringing forward this proposal. It's, I think it's really important we go to the table and just talk because the state blew it the first time uh, the Northern Arapaho tribe was pursuing casino gambling. And the state actually lost in court and was uh, whacked pretty strongly saying that we negotiated in bad faith. And I'm so, so glad that we kind of put that way, way behind us and you we're back at the table, perhaps, or eminently back at the table, maybe or maybe not. But I think that's a really good thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I think, too, you know, you look at Wyoming, and really every state tries to get out-of-staters to pay, you know, and, and <clears throat> Wyoming is probably the expert. We have been the, uh, we have been the gold standard to have you know, uh, out-of-staters really pay, and I think we've done a great job, and now we've saved so much money over the decades, and it's been really, uh, we've really done a great job of that, and I just think, I'd like to learn more about this. I mean, I think there's potential for, you know, maybe a lot of out-of-state folks to help pay that thing. I don't know, but I think it'd be an interesting thing to to learn a little more about this. I think the other part of me, my time in the legislature, I voted against every gaming thing until, the, until it was out of the bag. And it's, I mean, you go here in Casper and and it's all in our green statute books. I mean, it's, and it's, uh, so I think we wanna think about that a little bit, how we're, how we're doing that and how we can really maybe use it to really benefit our state, uh, maybe invert the current model we have, where it seems like a lot of it flows out of state by state people's money. <laughs> I mean, the people in Casper, it's not many out of staters playing these games. It's, uh, but it's interesting to think about. So, well, we sure appreciate you, uh, your thoughtful presentation and uh, joining us today. And I, and I think we'll just, uh, as a committee, just sit and think about this a little bit. Maybe 
uh, co-chairman and I will appoint a little small working group to work with you guys and learn some more and maybe bring it back to our next committee meeting. It's what I'm kind of thinking right now. And just and same with the solar panel issue. I think there's just more to learn than what we're going to get today, the time to do. So, but we appreciate everybody who uh, uh, put some ideas forward and because uh, it's just, it's like the, the work of the state. It never ends, right? It keeps on going. So we sure appreciate you. Okay, thank you very much. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you so much. That's awesome. Okay, next. Uh, so we're uh, we are well ahead of schedule, I Mr. think. Is Mr. there Mr. anyone else here? Uh, Senator Pappas has. Uh, it. Yeah, could I ask uh, uh, for for us to uh, try to uh, going back to the solar panel issue? Um, uh, my, I would like a little bit more data on on actually on all these um, efforts to raise revenue. I'm not so sure I know uh, how much electricity, number one, that all our schools use. Typically that's a district, you know, it's paid out of the block grant by the districts. Uh, and I don't know outside of, you know, I, I questioned the school facilities department, they don't have that number. Um, possibly WDE might have that number. But if not, uh, could we find out, uh, first of all, what, what the electric, bill is for the state schools. Uh, maybe somebody's already got that number. If not, can we poll the districts and ask them to give us on an annual basis so that we can uh, come to some calculation on if we do uh, provide energy efficient devices like solar panels, which I think are, you know, we certainly probably should be thinking that way. But I, I want to know what the revenue picture would be, what the savings would be versus the cost of putting them in and, you know, uh, what our return on, on, on our investment would be. Uh, and if we're looking at raising revenue, I think we need to see those kind of numbers. Um, and, and certainly with, with the gaming proposal as well, um, uh, I, I, just, I just need more information, more data. So could I request that? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I think, uh... You know, and again, just I think I'd like to I'll talk with the co-chairman here at break, but over the next couple of days, I think before we adjourn tomorrow, I'd like to have a maybe a small group get together. I think you're kind of volunteering, it sounds like. <laughs> and uh, and we go to work on these and learn about learn more about it and bring it back to the committee. Absolutely. And I think we can get all that information. It's out there. I mean, part of the ECA is utilities. We watch that separately, the cost of those. So we know every penny spent on utilities in the state schools. So, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Co-Chair. Um, thank you. I think the solar issue is a really important issue, and there's just tremendous amounts of, uh, of uh, federal subsidies for installation. And, you know, we definitely should take advantage of that. A concern that I have is under existing tariffs, utility tariffs that we have in Wyoming, that if someone uh, installs solar in a commercial or residential application, it actually burdens the other customers in the class. And it, it does so because the, the uh, payback rate is subsidized. So, um, you know, that's an important consideration if we had a massive installation of solar in a lot of our public buildings, how that might impact the, uh, uh, you know, if they qualified for ongoing subsidies, sand or net metering, then that will have a huge impact on other ratepayers who uh, are part of this system. And I don't think we'd want to do that. I mean, we want it to be kind of sustainable on its own. And so uh, that would be something to consider. Okay, very good. I think I've got two volunteers for this working group, two senators. Very good. I think those are, it's a very good point, Senator. Okay, any other discussion of this topic on K-12 revenue before we move to the next item on our agenda? Representative Sweeney. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, if, if we're looking for different ideas and uh, I, I am wondering if we could take a look at um, Representative Hallinan's um, 
proposal at our next meeting. Um, he nor I would be there to help push that, but that was a constitutional amendment proposal. And I don't know if that's worth looking at again um, in light of our current situation. Maybe refresh our memories a little bit. I got a good memory, but it's not that long. Doc, could you help? Go ahead, Representative Hallinan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and, and Representative Sweeney for bringing this up. It's a constitutional amendment that would take one third of the money that is put into the common school account uh, from the revenue that they get on the state lands. Uh, averages about $60 million a year now, I believe, uh, that they get. So they would, that would amount to about $30 million that would make available for the legislature to use for schools, only for schools. Uh, and that would go on for the next six years, according to the bill that I had uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the bill didn't make it in the Senate because uh, never brought up by the majority leader. Uh, but it did pass the House by a two thirds vote. So with that in mind, if uh, if there is an if there is a a body of folks here that want to see that bill brought up again, I think it's a good idea. It, re it makes available money to the schools on a on a permanent basis. Well, for six years it would be. After six years, it would have to be reapproved by the voters again. Uh, so I think that's a good idea. I think it was a good idea then, and I think it's a good idea now. So with that in mind, if you want to look at that bill, I'd be happy to see you do it. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Very good, thank you. Okay, any, are there, is there any public comment on this topic before we move? Anybody here in the room like to comment on this topic before we move on to the next topic? Okay, and nobody online comment on this. Mr. Chairman, uh, yeah. Michelle Irwin from the Powder River Basin Resource Council has her hand up. Okay, that'd be great. Well, she can close this out. That'd be great. Good morning. Hello again. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yeah, my apologies. Um, I didn't know whether I could respond to Senator Case's um, comment about the uh, cost sharing or cost um, issue about solar, concern with existing um, tariffs, etc. And I just wanted to um, say I did send a link um, via the LSO that refers to a study that addresses that. Um, and that from a residential perspective, at least, um, there is no burden. And if we look at this, especially with the IRA money, that these could actually be a benefit to communities. So just something else to kind of keep in mind about the changing economics of these. Okay, very good. We appreciate you sending us that information. Thank you for joining us. Okay, any other public comment? Okay, we'll move then, see none, we'll move to the next item on our agenda is skill-based amusement gaming. Now we're a little early. Do we need, uh, do we have folks who are gonna testify that are not here? Mick, go ahead. Okay, I think so too. Yeah. Sure. So I think and we'll try to stay kind of on time. It's not very often we're ahead of schedule. <laughs> Might be the first I ever recall. Uh, I don't think we. Yeah, so I think we'll just pause for a minute and uh, take a little break. Is there any other comments? We'll just take a little break and come back here in 15 minutes. 
And, I, I just uh, never thought chair. solving the school funding crisis would go so well. I know, so easy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so we'll come back in 15 minutes. Thank you. <coughs>
Okay, good morning again. That was the longest 15 minutes we've had in a while. Our agenda is a little lighter today. Many of our presenters for tomorrow's topics could not be here today. So that first topic went quicker than, than we'd planned, but we wanted to wait. We don't want to get too far ahead of schedule because folks are traveling here based on this schedule, but we think we've got everybody here. And as we work through this, if there's more comment, we'll, we'll probably take this one all the way to lunch then. Or so whether we have to um, make adjustments then. So we are on topic number two, uh, skill-based amusement gaming. We have a couple build drafts members and it's on the public, it's on the website. And uh, so I think the first plan here um, we want to go through bill drafts first, Josh, or we want to have some presentations from the Gaming Commission. Um, up to you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to, to walk through the bills first, or if the Gaming Commission wants to present first. Uh, um, how about we How about we just go through these bills real sure. quick? They're pretty short bills and pretty straightforward. And then we'll... Then we'll back away from the bills a little bit and then we'll hear from folks and then we can take further action on those bills. So thank you. Sure thing, Mr. Chairman, uh, Josh Anderson, LSO. Um, so if you remember um, way back in uh, April, uh, well, up in Lander, we uh, had a gaming commission um, in front of the committee and, and out of those discussions, uh, the committee requested um, two bills the first one, 23 LSO 64, um, this bill um, just uh, specifies, oh, excuse me, specifies authorized locations uh, for skill-based amusement games. Um, getting into the bill on page two, uh, it defines establishment as a place of business that operates as a truck stop or that is licensed or permitted to sell alcoholic liquor or malt beverages. Um, under those specified statutes. See a staff comment there. Um, um, after those discussions, um, um, at that last meeting, um, it was indicated that that uh, an amendment from the 2021 session um, did a lot of this work already. So I took this list of statutes from that amendment, um, but would note that it does exclude a couple um, winery permits under 20. Or 124414 and microbrewery permits under 124415. So, just for committee discussion, there. Um, the bill then defines a truck stop as a place, uh, business premises equipped with diesel islands uh, that sell on average 25,000 gallons of diesel fuel each month uh, based on either the previous 12 month sales or that are forecasted to sell. Uh, 25,000 gallons of diesel fuel each month over the next 12 months and also has uh, then a requirement that it also be located on um, at least two acres um, and include a convenience store with parking spaces dedicated to commercial motor, motor vehicles. Uh, the bill then specifies that skill-based amusement games shall only be located at an establishment um, except as provided in subsection E Subsection E would then um, uh, grandfather in any um, skill-based amusement games that were located um, at a place of business that does not meet the definition, net definition of establishment um, on April 1 of 2023 and makes the act uh, effective on that date. Take any questions on that one, Mr. Chairman, or I'll get into the next bill. Questions, committee? Uh, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Anderson, the definition of truck stop, where did you, how did you come up with that? Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Gray. Uh, yeah, that was straight out of that uh, uh, amendment that I was directed to look at uh, from the 2021 session. So that was one that had been looked at. I think it uh, came out of, um, out of the uh, House Committee uh, amendment, and and so that's it, where I took that amendment from. Okay, thank you, members. Any other questions? Okay, 
Okay, thank you. And then you want to move on to the next bill. And then we're going to come back. We're just kind of getting an intro to these, and we'll come back and work on these. Okay, go ahead. Sure thing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next bill, uh, 23 LSO 65, this uh, was a request um, from the committee to consider a bill that would allow counties to opt out of skill-based amusement games. Um, so uh, the bill just uh, provides that uh, skill-based amusement games are authorized to be to operate in the state uh, subject to uh, subsection D, which then authorizes um, the Board of County Commissioners to submit to the voters the question of whether skill-based amusement games should be prohibited. Um, specifies that if they're prohibited, no new skill-based amusement games will be authorized. Um, it does provide a, a grandfather period of uh, five years. That was uh, a number that was discussed at that April committee meeting um, uh, that they would be allowed to be continued to operate after that prohibition for an additional five years and then um, provides a process for a county that has previously prohibited games to then authorize, reauthorize games uh, by another vote. Um, those are the two bills, Mr. Chairman. Okay, very good. Take any so, questions. Any questions, members, on the second bill? Representative Jennings? First bill? Yeah, let's go ahead. Any question then on that first bill? Go ahead, Representative Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Anderson, on page two at the very bottom, line 28, it says that uh, that is projected to sell. Who gets to project that? That is a good uh, question, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would guess it would be um, likely the Gaming Commission that would be authorizing or determining if something is in a, uh, an establishment or not. Okay. Follow up? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what's the expertise of the Gaming Commission towards projecting truck stop fuel usage? Go ahead, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would, I would defer that to them. Um, I'm uh -huh. sure they could uh, set up by uh, rule uh, uh, different things that could be submitted to support that. Mr. Chairman, but I would defer to them. Mr. Hey, Chairman. Um, Mr. Co-Chair. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, I think what they're trying to get at is big establishments versus little ones, and maybe there's a different way to measure that. Um, maybe the number of pumps, for example, um, if there's something possible. Go ahead, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the on the second bill draft, Mr. Anderson, what is the direction and statute in, in the election code on the wording of the ballot language? Because I mean obviously that's that's pivotal here. I mean are we just leaving up to the county commission to to word that ballot language is it going to be up to the secretary of state uh is there any direction in putting in the ballot language the revenue effects of this because that that would uh that would possibly change the the way it's viewed so what what is it key into in terms of direction and statute for the ballot language thank you go ahead mr anderson uh, mr chairman i believe that the ballot language would, would be up to the to the county commissioners so um, certainly, there's other examples where um, that the specific language um, is included in the statute, and that certainly could be a direction the committee could take. Okay, so Mr. Anderson, so as you read that kind of that first part of putting it forward, lines 11 through 15 on page two, it's commission puts it forward. And then if they are banned, you go to page three in those last few lines, the question can be submitted in the reverse to bring them back either by the commission or the voters, right? Or is it not? Is that? Mr. Chairman, I believe it would it would still be up to still the, the county commission. County okay, I, I read to... that. I read it. I got it now, I think. Okay, so it's the same. The county commission is in charge of the question. Okay, very good. Both both ways. Representative Yen. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Anderson, so that projection language, that is also from that House Appropriations Amendment that ended up failing on the floor, is that correct? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, yes, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Okay. Any other questions? 
Okay, very good. So I think, and we're gonna, we're gonna come back and see if we're gonna have motions on these bills and take public comment, but I wanna first go to the Gaming Commission and they've got some materials to present to us and then we'll open it up for public comment and then we'll see what, you know, the direction of the committee on these bills. Good morning, Director Moore. If you want to introduce yourself and your team, that'd be great. Good morning, committee members. For the record, my name is Charles Moore. With me today, I have President of the Commission, uh, Commissioner Bob Davis, and then on the other on the other side there, I have David Carpenter, Project Manager for Skill Games and for Online Sports Wagering. <clears throat> if I could just briefly um, go into a bit of a just a kind of an intro here as Wyoming moves forward in gaming is important to understand high quality gaming operators support good regulation without such regulation all operators are judged by the worst of them one bad apple can sour the perception of the entire industry as I've said several times in Wyoming gaming is illegal except for and we have these many exceptions online sports wagering paramutual skill based music games charitable lottery and tribal gaming. But as we move forward and continue to consider gaming in general, I would echo the concerns raised with expansion um, and the need for sideboards. Without some form of limitation, we will find ourselves in a volatile and precarious spot. I would like to impress upon you the importance of providing the agency with clear and concise guidance and your intent. We do have an update that we had provided for you today um, on revenues. We have the revenues um, for online sports wagering, horse racing, historic racing. If you'd like us to, we could walk through that. I could have David Carpenter walk through that. I also have an update that I can give you right now on the skill-based amusement game rules. Um, while it has taken 18 months um, to develop the rules to this point, always understand that with the Scrivener's error, we had to pause. So it's really only been since June since we've been hard at it and we are very close to having those rules completed. In fact, next week at our commission meeting on the 22nd, um, we're hoping that those rules will be completed and ready to go forward. And the commission takes an approach with, with doing rules. We would like to have those rules vetted before we go into public comment. We feel like that's the appropriate way to address rules is to get all those problems worked out ahead of time. And then the goal of the commission is, for the most part, to have zero comments once we do go into that official comment period. We wanna do our job upfront. So that's exciting news. Um, we're also moving forward with rules on the Breeders' Award Program. The Breeders' Award Program, for some of you that may not know, and we administer this program, is a $4 million plus dollar a year program. It's an incentive program. It's an incentive program for Wyoming people to have Wyoming horses to race in the state of Wyoming and to breed and raise. It affects the agriculture side of the business. It affects um, the property values. Um, in the Evanston area and different places, we have individuals that are purchasing property coming from out of state, purchasing prop property so they can participate in that program. The Wyoming Breeders Award Program is the number one program, incentive program in North America per capita. We eclipse all other programs as far as incentive programs um, per capita. And we're excited, we've, we've revised some of the rules and uh, worked on those for several months and we should have those concluding shortly. Another set of rules that we're dealing with is bingo, pull tab, and Calcutta rules. As you all know, we're tasked with licensing bingo and Calcutta and developing rules to promulgate. Um, those rules will be out. The first draft of those rules will be considered at the commission meeting next week and we're excited about getting those out. Um, they're relatively simple, by the way. Also, if you've had a chance to go to our website, we have a tremendous amount of material on our website. Um, we, are, we are very focused at trying to keep that material fresh and new. We have 
have a map of the state on the website that shows all the locations that we have, whether it's horse racing locations, whether it's historic racing locations, or whether it's uh, skill-based amusement games. Also on that map, you can see the area that has been carved out for online sports wagering that's an exception um, to taking wagers. Um, that's the tribal area. It's a tribal map that we have there that we've developed. Um, and there's no, no a lot, we, we do not allow um, wagers to be accepted from that tribal area. So I would encourage you if you haven't taken the opportunity to go to a website, we have a number of terminals in the communities. We have, have graphs on that. We also have the lists of the locations for, like I said, for the historic racing as well. And one other note, just, just a side note, um, we were really fortunate about a month ago to have Chairman Semmemeyer visit us here in Casper. For those of you that do not know who Chairman Semmemeyer is, he is the chairman of the Indian Gaming Commission, National Indian Gaming Commission. He came to Wyoming. I've developed a um, communication with him over the last several months with online sports wagering and different programs. And he was here in Casper and spent a couple of hours with not only myself, but President Davis and also Commissioner Wildcat. And it was a really, really good conversation trying to work with our tribal neighbors. So with that, I would turn over um, the, the updates on the revenues to Mr. Carpenter. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. Good morning, Chairman Harshman, members of the committee. Pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, so we're gonna start with live horse racing. Um, to date, we've had $772 million worth of, or excuse me, $1,000 worth of total handle. Um, this does not include Wyoming horse racing, who is still actively racing as we speak. Um, Wyoming Downs and 307 horse racing are both done for the year. So those numbers are finalized for them. I would expect Wyoming horse racing to be somewhere around 400,000 to 500,000 probably. Um, so we should end up over around $1.1 million in total handle on live racing. Following up with that, we have historic horse racing. Um, we are actually around 780 million, I believe, if not over 800 million in total handle as of today. Um, as of this report, which, is, which was June 30th, we were at 614,871,000 approximately. Um, based on my forecasts, I would expect us to be over $1 billion by the end of October. Um, and um, as you can see, it breaks down by each individual operator as well. If you have any questions on that, feel free to ask. Moving on to simulcast, um, we're at 1.9 million in total handle this year through June 30th again. And um, the breakdowns on those are, again, by operator at all of their locations. Advanced deposit wagering is 1.6 million. And that runs across about 11 different advanced deposit wagering operators that are all run by out-of-state um, companies. Moving on to skill-based amusement games. I've broken this down by individual vendor. Um, you can see to this point this year, we have tax due of just under 2.6 million. I expect that number to be hopefully right around between four and five by the end of the year. Um, revenue on that is 45 million to date. And you can see there in the graph, you can see um, a little bit of a dip there in April, May, looks like perhaps we were concerned about paying our taxes and then it went right back up to, to where, where it needs to be on the mean. Online sports wagering, we uh, just hit our 12th month of operation. Um, to date, we've had $122 million in total wagers. 
this uh, this September as as we enter the football season. I expect to to see things go back up quite a bit. We've kind of had a decline over the last few months, and that's a very seasonal thing. Um, Mid-season baseball is not the most exhilarating sport to bet on, I, th I don't think. Um, but it'll be real interesting to see how the month of September plays out. We did uh, six million last September, and then um, I think we popped up to over ten, around twelve, between ten and twelve million over the course of the rest of the NFL season and college football as well. Um, one thing I do want to point out on that too is that we have a our geolocation vendor, GeoComply, they uh, they provided us with a map that we have in, in our office. And if any of you guys are welcome to come take a look at it, it's really interesting to watch, particularly during Wyoming games, um, Broncos games, you can just see that thing light up. It certainly doesn't look like New York's, but um, it's, it's still pretty neat to watch for, for our state. Moving along, this one's very small. Let me wrap my mind around it here. Okay, so this is uh, this is another online sports wagering, and this actually shows just a month by month. So again, you can see that 6.2 million when we kicked off in September of last year. Um, that NFL season going all the way through February to the Super Bowl was well over $10 million each month. Uh, March Madness was one of our, if not the highest month that we've ever had. And then uh, and then we tapered down as we got back into that basketball or baseball season that I, that I spoke of short, briefly ago. Um, on the next pages, we have our historic horse racing locations and terminal counts. This has been something that we've been putting together lately based on county commissioners and, and cities asking some questions and expressing some concerns about the volume of locations and terminals. Um, I have pretty good eyesight, but I'm not sure that I can read those numbers based on this. Um, I can provide some of that. <laughs> I don't think that's a will work for me. Um, you can see on a, on a location basis, you can see the number of terminals approved. You can see the number of terminals that we actually do have, um, and that goes by each individual operator. The pie charts, which which I can't see, um, that goes by city and by county. Um, very helpful, and we can provide a much larger version of that to anybody interested. Moving along from there, we list out our skill game vendors that are approved to operate in the state of Wyoming. Um, I believe there are 14 vendors currently operating and that spans across approximately 300 different locations throughout the state. Each one is listed in the second part of that under operator name. They are primarily your, your standard bars. Um, there are the occasional truck stops few smoke shops um, and a couple hotels that you'll see. Moving along from there, um, I snuck this in on you guys this morning, but I did put together a forecast pursuant to our, our last discussion together. Um, and this, given the time, I did not do online sports wagering. It's just too early to be able to try to come up with any forecasts. But I did do historic horse racing, which I projected out to be about $1.265 billion for the, for the year 2022. Um, I believe that number to be fairly accurate. Um, from there, it gets a little wild in my Excel models, um, but you know, it's not that far-fetched either as we continue to see growth. Um, 2023, I projected at about 1.5 billion, 2024 at 1.7 billion, and 2025 at 1.9 billion. I also provided some lower and upper confidence bounds on those. And um, then on the flip side of that, you have skill-based amusement games forecast. 
This one, and I do want to point out the historic horse racing side is on total wagers, total handle. Um, the skill-based amusement game side is going to be on net proceeds, which I feel is a much easier calculation for tax purposes. So for 2022, we have about $24.7 million of net proceeds. Of course, the tax on that is 20%, and then 45% would go to SFBA, 45% to the cities, counties, 10% to the commission. 2023, I project out at $26.5 million. And um, this does not include any growth. We haven't had growth in this particular industry since we shut down during the Scrivener's era. So this is very static. Um, so there is currently no estimate on what may happen in the near future. And I will stand for any questions. Uh, Representative Baker has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, two questions. One, um, is it possible, you had mentioned, Mr. Chairman, you know, the, the, the activity that goes on here in Casper is not really out of staters. Is it possible to gauge, or do you have a way of gauging of, of how much your uh, of your revenue is from in-staters and how much is from out-of-staters that's the first question secondly um, the breeders cup um, that was the original i think vision of of the bill the original bill the enacting bill um, and, it, and it was spread out but you mentioned the four million dollars and you said that uh, it's the highest per capita and and you kind of mentioned it as a badge of honor and I'm just, I wonder, is that the case or is it really the highest per capita because there's a lack of participation locally? Because I know in our area, we've heard some concerns about uh, jockeys not wanting to come in because there's not facilities, some of that sort of stuff. So it's keeping a lot of people away, which would increase the per capita. So uh, can you respond to that? Okay, two yeah. questions. So that first one on, you know, where, where do you think? In state, out of state? Chairman Harshman, Representative Baker, thank you and, and, and great questions. Um, the first one, you know, with, with the gaming activity that we currently have, um, it appears, and, and I think I can follow up with some better data for you, um, if you'd like, for the committee with historic racing. I think it's a very high percentage of Wyoming people placing wagers at the Wyoming locations. Now, if we separate that to live racing and we go to the live racing in Evanston, Wyoming, that is a 98, 90, maybe 99% out of state coming to the races there. With the skill-based amusement games, it's a high percentage. It's, they are designed for local establishments, for local participation. That is what it was designed. It was designed as an addition for um, a bar, grill, something to have just to supplement their revenue. So it is in-state probably, I would guess, close to 100% of that revenue that's coming in. To your second question, um, the, the Breeders' Award Program, and again, thank you. Um, the Breeders' Award Program, there's a lot of factors, and, and you touched on those, and, and it's obvious, you know, you've done some research and, and had, some, had some very valuable input in that. Um, as purses grow, and the purses have grown exponentially at the races, whether it's Rock Springs, whether it's Evanston, or whether it's in Gillette, more horses come, more jockeys show up, start showing up. We get more participants in the races. Currently, they're running on Fridays when they race. They're racing anywhere from eight to nine races. On Saturdays and Sundays, they're racing um, 10 races a day, typically is a typical program. And part of that is, is by design, keeping the crowd, looking at a lot of those things. So. To your point, I think, is the participation. Um, is it per capita? You know, it, it's, it's a lot of things that go into that. It's a yes and a no 
response, and I apologize for it being that way. Um, but I can provide you with the list of recipients from last year. Um, Broken Bones Cattle Company, for instance, which is in Lander, Wyoming. Um, they were the high earner from the Breeders Incentive Program last year. And they have participating at the racetracks between the horses they own and they've sold, um, maybe 20, 30 head um, total, maybe more. I don't know what that number is offhand, but again, we can get that for you. We have all those figures for you. So, you know, I really can't answer your question, you know, exactly right at this point. It's a combination of a lot of things. Um, so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick follow up. Um, would it be possible moving forward to maybe coordinate with the, the facilities that are holding these uh, and, and maybe work towards some of these upgrades? I know that, you know, we see like things like the high altitude facility. It, it's huge in trying to recruit people. And, and when you're trying to recruit people to these races and come participate, but the facilities aren't, I guess, up to standard, mm -hmm. I think it's going to continue. We're going to continue to see the, the resistance that we see regardless of the purse. I mean, the purse is going to be there and that's going to incentivize people, but people want to have good facilities. So I'd like to see, you know, or, or see, is there a way moving forward that you could coordinate with the local counties that own these facilities and, and maybe start to see some improvements with the proceeds? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Chairman Harshman and Representative Baker, again, that is happening now um, with Sweetwater County, um, your, your district. Um, they are already looking at improvements. Um, we had gone to to the facility several years ago with some things that we knew that we needed, um, and we're looking. They're looking at more safety um, issues, and we will be shortly um, adopting some of the safety requirements that are out there with um, the federal law that's that's requiring. Which means, you know, a tremendous amount of investment for these locations to upgrade. Um, safety rails, um, a lot of different different things go into that. And again, I can provide all that in a follow up with you if you'd like to see that. I know Wyoming Downs each year continues to upgrade their facility. And I also know that uh, um, the facility in Campbell County continues to upgrade. Um, both Campbell County and Sweetwater, they have um, the state of the art um, safety rails that they've installed. Now, that's at the expense of the operators, the permittees. That's at their expense. But then I know in Campbell County, they're looking at, at additional um, jockey's corridors, giving a little better locations and upgrading everything across the board. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Moore, so I have, I have two questions. The, I'm trying to remember the first one, so I'll go with the second one. If we expanded skill-based amusement games, do you think it would affect the forecast of what historic horse racing would bring in? Chairman Harshman, uh, Representative Yin, I, I'm not sure I can, it doesn't appear to be at this point. And I think the question may be putting it a little differently, is there a cannibalization feature feature in that? And, and it does not appear to be that way right now. So um, I think the answer would be no to your question. And, and one thing, if I can get this out there real quickly, if you don't mind, you know, when you're looking at these figures, and David touched on it briefly, horse racing is calculated in a total different way than the others. And, and for anyone that's either new to this or, you know, with the horse racing side of it, while it's a blended percentage, because it, it does shift and move with, di with different figures being calculated in there from different programs, it's a blended 1.9% tax rate on the total handle. And the total handle, you know, is the total amount wagered. So the effective rate, of that, if you calculate it and do a comparison, and we did comparisons for the legislative 
um, branch several years ago trying to compare all this so, so you could get a perspective. Um, they're looking at about a 23, maybe 24 percent um, effective tax rate. So then we're looking at skill-based amusement games at a 20 percent. So they're all right in that, that, that same category when you look at that. I just wanted to get that out. Follow up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I did remember my second question, my original question, which is, so the monthly wagers for online sports wagering is almost three times the amount of revenue from skill-based amusement games. So I guess my question is, why is the taxable, why is the tax that tax revenue that we get from online sports wagering so much lower than from skill-based amusement games? Go ahead. Uh, Chair Mr. Carpenter. Yeah. Chairman Harshman, Representative Yim, thank you for the question. Um, you know, with, with skill games, it's 20% on the net proceeds, so we've taken out what's been paid in. Um, you know, there's, there's the skill aspect of that where it's kind of up to the patron to, uh, to decide whether they're gonna play the puzzles or, or any of that. With sports wagering, we do have that 10% tax rate and it's also on net proceeds, so we've taken out the patron payouts. Um, you know, if you look to Vegas, where there's pretty, a pretty high concentration of professional type sports bettors, um, you know, they run about, I guess, to put it in perspective, the house is kind of guaranteeing themselves about 5%. And so then it's kind of based on the, the savviness or, or intellectual side of the bettors themselves. So, so Vegas and Nevada as a whole, they run about 5.6%. In Wyoming, we're at about 9.2 right now. We're on the we're on the higher end as far as what the house is actually taking in. Um, that said, they are allowed to deduct out federal excise tax on that. They're also deducting out any voided wagers or canceled wagers for a variety of different reasons. And then as it stands right now, they're allowed to deduct part of that promotional and free betting that they do that you see on billboards and in some of the ads. Um, you know, and one, one thing to think about in that respect is the idea of this is to, to take people, take the patrons away from those illegal mar markets, the offshore markets, and bring them onto this legal regulated market. So at the end of the day, it's a very tight, it's a very tight margin altogether across the nation on online sports wagering. So it's very volume based. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. So to follow up, um, I mean, I think I think I hear you say that that the revenue from skill based amusement games, I mean, the house what the house brings home from skill based amusement games tends to be higher than online sports wagering. But I, I'm curious on whether we should be including those promotional promotional wagers in, our, um, in removing that from taxable gaming revenue. And I'm curious on what your thoughts on what would happen if we did that. Chairman Harshman, Representative Yen. Um, that's something that we were in discussions with um, at JAC just on Monday. Um, you know, like I said, it's, it's kind of a, a deal to try to get some things over from the illicit markets for one thing. Um, to, to talk specific numbers to this point, um, we have deducted or allowed for the deduction of about $330,000 in promos and free bets to this point, um, resulting in $33,000 worth of tax. Um, and in doing so, basically, we, we essentially wrote off that very first month, that month of September, as a no tax because of those free bets. Um, that was obviously a big month to try to get people into the market itself. And so our first two operators, they both took a loss on that month. From there on out, they have never, ever taken another loss. Um, we had our third operator come in in, I believe, December, January. Um, actually, they they came online in March, right ahead of March Madness, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, they did take a loss for two months, and um, then from there on out, they've been steady ever since. Um, our fourth operator, when they came on, they did not take a single loss from month one, and they've continued in cruise control ever since. 
So it's very, it's very on the front end. Representative Sweeney has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, uh, first off, uh, thanks, for, thanks for these highlights. I think it uh, really is, is very useful and helpful. Um, kind of a follow-up on Representative Yen's uh, thought process, I guess, um, is it seems to me if, if you look at the year-to-date uh, HHR uh, total handle um, and then the tax, which I'm only counting state, LISRA, and city, county, uh, that appears to be 8.4, 8 8.5, 8 um, million January through June 30th, and then compared to uh, skill base um, at uh, the the 45 million um, total revenue in uh, tax due of the 2.5 2.6 million uh, during that same same period, are we do do you truly believe that we're on par? It it almost appears to me, quite honestly, that we're taxing skill based higher in my mind than at a higher rate than historic horse racing. Just looking percentage wise. Um, but I I think Director Moore kind of talked about that. But do you have any thoughts on that? Chairman Harshman, Representative Sweeney, thank you for the question. Um, you know, it's it's kind of difficult to say because we're kind of talking about, you know, essentially apples and oranges, maybe even apples and peanut butter. I don't I don't really know where you're talking. You know, historic horse racing is on total handle, and that's a very large number. Um, but then we're talking about smaller percentages, and in those numbers, as um, Director Moore alluded to, there is there is some fluctuation in how those numbers are calculated at times. Um, there are some very stationary numbers, but there are other numbers that, that kind of teeter a little bit. Um, on the skill game side, it, it really comes down to, you know, the, the patron's chances of winning. And, in, you know, at the end of the day, the way skill-based amusement games are designed, Technically speaking, someone could win on every single play. And so that doesn't happen, obviously, because we're seeing pretty high percentages here. Um, but at the end of the day, we're, it's, it's all calculated on net proceeds after the payouts to the players. And so it's, it's just a very different concept, I would say. Hopefully that helps. Schuler has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one quick question on the online sports wagering. The fourth company that came in uh, has the same name as one of the other companies. What's the deal there, I guess, with that? Um, can you explain that? Chairman Harshman, Senator Schuler, I thought I had changed this. It was a. It was something that I. Uh, it was a typo, um, and honestly. So the, the 63 million that you're seeing on the bottom next to Caesars, that is um, that would actually be not accurate at all. Um, and I apologize and I'll get this back up. I, d I think we noticed this the other day and obviously didn't get it fixed in here. But Caesars at the 34,000 is the accurate number. Um, FanDuel would be the fourth one on that bottom line. However, the monthly wagers is inaccurate. Um, I believe the monthly wagers for FanDuel off the top of my head would probably be um, down around like probably four million, somewhere in there, uh, five million. And all the rest of those numbers are actually accurate for FanDuel with the exception of that monthly wagers. And I do again apologize for that. That's a, a, a typo. 
So. Chairman Harshman, uh, Senator Schuler will have that corrected and get a corrected copy to this committee later this afternoon, and we do apologize for that. We had noticed that, um, and that I'm guessing we accidentally pulled a PDF that should have been deleted, so we do apologize for that. Um, a couple other things, if you don't mind, Chairman Harshman, um, if I could move on. Um, during the last meeting, we spoke uh, briefly about conflict of interest, um, and then there was that discussion about that. Um, the Commission has been working hard on, on resolving that. Uh, we have some very good proposals um, that we're presenting at the next meeting on the 22nd about conflict of interest and dealing with that, um, getting some policies in place and, and working through that. Interesting enough, and thank you to David um, seeing it, um, originally when the paramutual st statutes were developed in uh, 67, it was very clear nobody on the commission would have any interest in any horse um, of any kind. And then about seven, eight years later, that was changed. So, but we are working on that. Um, another thing, the $300,000 that transfers to the Department of Health, um, we have been slow to get that, that transferred. Um, part of the problem was um, with that is we have to do a B11 to make that transfer. So we're working through that right now and also waiting on the Department of Health. Um, they'll get us here shortly, um, the coding, how to make that transfer and where they want that to go. Um, and then one follow up with Representative Baker um, on the participants at the races. A very high percentage of the individuals that are racing here in the state are from out of state. So we do have a core group of people um, that are, and, and, the, and I'm speaking of the trainers, the jockeys that are from Wyoming, but the majority of the trainers and the jockeys do come from out of state. Now, conversely, a lot of the ownership is from Wyoming, and we have a fairly blended um, ownership of the horses. Um, so. So there's a lot of that um, in, in trying to stimulate um, people coming from other states. But, but something that's really interesting, and I have to go back 50 years um, probably to make this comparison. Um, people come from other parts of the country wanting to bring their horses to Wyoming. Interesting enough, they think they're coming to kind of pick the low hanging fruit. Well, when they get here, they find, oops, we should have brought our, our number one team. And, and so it's, it's really interesting. There was a point in my life to where I looked at some of that low hanging fruit and would go places to where you could pick a little of that and get some easy pickings. Well, that's not the case here. Um, we have people that are racing here in Wyoming. They're stepping beyond Wyoming as their careers advance and they're going on, they're participating at the national level, whether it's in the thoroughbred industry or whether it's in the quarter horse industry racing. This is a stepping stone for a lot of these people and it's, it's tough. So that's all I have, thank you. Okay, any other questions of the, of, uh, the commission? Appreciate the three of you being here today and you stand by because we're not finished. We're just getting started. Uh, and here's how I'd like to, we're gonna go back and work these bills formally, but I'd like to do any other comment on this topic. Uh, we've got time, I think, and then we'll uh, go on and work these bills and even do more public comment as needed and necessary. Okay, so thank you, gentlemen. Any folks here that would like to comment or visit about this topic a little bit? And uh, any thoughts? I see Mr. Mosher over here. Yeah, just come forward and. Legislation. Yeah, and I think we're gonna, and you you bet, I think bring that up and then it might inform our kind of thoughts as we get going on these bills. And we'll have more public comment on the bills as we work them like normal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay. Sure. Uh, addressing the two draft pieces of legislation, Mike Mosier, Wyoming State Liquor Association. 
it's probably good on the heels of the presentation. Uh, I'm gonna start with the positive committee because I I'm a positive guy. Uh, 23LSO0064, uh, the uh, authorized locations, we support. Uh, expansion of skill games is going to happen. Uh, it's gonna happen in upcoming months. However, as a guy that's represented things that sometimes can be controversial, too much of something can be a bad thing, whether it's gaming, whether it's liquor, uh, not just on the industry, but on the, the impact on our communities. And this is a good step in that direction. We support expansion, but we don't ex ex support willy-nilly expansion of, of skill games. Uh, and that's, that's why I think this bill really addresses this well. They need to be in appropriate establishments. They don't need to be in every shop down the street. Now, the part of the reason we support expansion quickly is because there were a number of establishments, uh, liquor establishments, that on the side of caution, since it wasn't authorized in statute, where the individual had other gaming interests and didn't want to do skill games until it was in statute, or they have a law enforcement or judiciary background, or they're just cautious. They were waiting until it got put in statute. Now, there's been discussion about too much expansion of gaming <clears throat> recently, and a lot of people confuse HHR with skill games, historic horse racing. There has been no growth in skill games in over two years. In fact, it's actually shrank a little bit because some places have changed, they've gone out of business, but no new, no new ones have been authorized. Uh, <clears throat> let me talk about the difference. If it's a liquor establishment, I had a meeting yesterday with the Laramie County Liquor Association. They, for some reason, they've got their hair on fire over a bill and joint corporations. And we came onto this topic and we were talking about it. And I said, do any of you have signs in front of your, on your establishment that say, come inside and play our skill games? And they said, no. I mean, it's just part of our business. You'd find out you'd got them if you walk in. And I said, well, who has them? It's big signs. And they said, one place, convenience store, no gas, it's, it's what drives their traffic. I don't want that. I don't want beacons that say, play your skill games here. I want you to know if that place has skill games when you know you go in the place because it's a side business. That's why a lot of people couldn't understand why we supported a limit of four because we want the focus of the hospitality or retail business to be on the business and for this to be periphery, peripheral traffic. Uh, what would happen without this wonderful draft is a willy-nilly expansion that we couldn't control. Uh, what you'd end up with, and I'll just think of the biggest town in your district. What's going to happen is Joe's Antique Shop will think, well, heck, that's a great idea. He's downtown, gets four skill games. Jane's Bookshop next door goes, darn, Joe's getting some serious traffic off of those things. So they get them, then the gas station down the street gets them, then the curio shop down the street gets them, and before too long, you go to your downtown and every storefront has skill games. We don't want that. That's not the impact on our community that we want. And like I said, it's not just me. I'm, I'm a little more of a Puritan than most people think. It's not just the puritanical side of me. I know the backlash. Same with liquor, same with anything else. If you have too much of it, you end up with bad things happening and it ends up hurting you in the long run. And so I think this is of vital importance. Um, why liquor establishments? <clears throat> well, one of the misconceptions, and I'll clear this up, is that people only 21 or over are allowed in liquor establishments. No, uh, people can go in with their parents or in a restaurant area, or they can walk in shopping, as long, but, but, well, package liquor store, they have to be with somebody over 21 or 21 or over, but we are trained to card people. That's our job. Whether it's a restaurant, whatever it is, we know who is 21 and who is not. We do training in how to card people. Law enforcement does compliance checks to make sure we know who is 21 or over, and it's up to a $750 fine if you don't do it right. And so there's a huge pressure on liquor licensees to know who is 21 or over in that establishment. Do they have that same training in a curio shop or a laundromat? I doubt it. Uh, but once again, that goes back to what are appropriate uh, areas. Now, when we talk about numbers of expansion, uh, as I don't know, I've mentioned this in this committee, we have approximately 1,400 liquor licensees in the state of Wyoming. 
about 300 half skill games at this point, uh, few, maybe fewer because that's the total number and there's some other places that have them right now. If you do this bill, which I pray you do, uh, with the expansion, you're maybe talking about doubling, maybe a little more, because of those 1,400 licensees, bear in mind you're talking about chain establishments. You're not going to see a big box store or a chain restaurant putting skill games in. It's not in their footprint. Uh, you're talking about packaged liquor stores. Most of them aren't going to want it. Uh, manufacturers, that's included in the 1,400. Manufacturer probably isn't going to do that. Malt beverage permits, event centers, there's a whole slew of places or an establishment that is concerned about ambiance. I don't know about you guys, but if I go to a fine dining establishment, I don't want to have a nice meal with people playing on skill games behind me. And so I don't think the majority of places that could get them with these sideboards would even want them. But what, who would get them are the places I mentioned before or the fraternal organizations who weren't visited by a salesperson before everything went dark on expansion. And so I feel this bill is vitally important for that. One concern I have, and I saw an amendment as I walked in uh, that fixes the one concern I have. If we have expansion, say by November 1, November, December 1, uh, when this bill passes, I say when because I'm an optimistic soul, when this bill passes, you will have a window, even if you make it effective immediately, of about three months. And in that period of time, things are gonna go nuts. There's gonna be places popping all over Wyoming that aren't liquor establishments. Uh, and you can't really take that back. Now, do I believe in grandfathering? Yes, I do. Uh, but I don't want, I don't think we should grandfather those establishments that open beyond this point if we're working on these sideboards. So I think that amendment addresses it well by saying they have to be in operation basically now. So you can't open 30 laundromats or assisted living centers or church basements before that, after that period of time and stay in business. Uh, so that's that on that bill, and I'll take any questions now or in the future. The second bill draft, now bear in mind the other thing, this is important with liquor licenses. Uh, with liquor licenses, the city is in control. When we talk about expansion and you, you have too many, cities have the ability with liquor licenses to tell you what you can or can't do. Where that normally happens, committee, is if Mike's package liquor store wants to open up and they say, okay, Mosier, you can do a packaged liquor store here, but you've got a Catholic church around, across the block. And we don't want on-premise, we don't want bar sales because we don't want your customers commingling with midnight mass. They can say packaged liquor at this location. They can tie it to a location. They can put conditions on that liquor license. And so they have full control over what happens. I mean, I assume a city could require my wait staff to wear clown suits. I have, they, they, can, they can put conditions on that license. Probably not the best business model, but I've seen worse. Uh, and so that's one advantage of a liquor license that you don't have with other businesses. You can't do that with an antique shop or any other store. Uh, lastly, on the second draft committee, 23 LSO 0065, we are opposed to the opt-out idea. Uh, I think with the, with, with the previous bill draft I addressed, you really don't need any opt-in and opt-out. If you do an opt-out, my question to you is, are, should we do an opt-out bill for bingo, pull tabs, uh, lottery, poker, Calcutta, and historic horse racing? For those of you who haven't been around for a while, most counties who voted in paramutual wagering did it when I was a teenager. And so their permission to allow those established, I know that was a long time ago. That was territorial days. That's changed this a little bit. We added a whole lot to what paramutual wagering is. When people voted that in the 70s and 80s, mostly 70s, they didn't imagine racinos. We didn't do historic horse racing until 2007. And I'm not talking against it, but that's not what they voted on is what they got now. So if we open the door to a county opt-out, we have to open it to pretty much everything. And I think if you put strict controls over how expansion is run, that that pretty much takes care of anybody's concern. Because then the licensing authority can dictate that. 
However, I really haven't seen expansion of skilled games being a major issue if it's in this environment just because you don't advertise as a gaming establishment. And that seems to be what I'm hearing in communities is they don't want lots of storefronts with flashing lights saying, play your skill games here. So Mr. Chairman, I thank you for this opportunity. I hope it was an appropriate time and I'll be happy to take any questions. I know Representative Sweeney has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Mr. Mosier, uh, you mentioned in your testimony several times, we don't believe uh, that that's the best interest. Were you, is we uh, the Wyoming State Liquor Association or is we the state of, as a citizen of the state of Wyoming? Mr. Oh, Chairman, yeah. Representative Sweeney, great question. I would say see all of the above. I don't think the state of Wyoming wants downtown with flashing signs that say play your, play your skill games here. The reason the Liquor Association would be concerned about that is, as I mentioned before, if you have too much of something, especially something that they can be to lead people too much, losing too much money and stuff, which in bars and, and restaurants you have a controlled environment, it'll backlash on you. And like I said, the same is true with alcohol sales. If things go too willy-nilly, it'll bite you and the pendulum's gonna swing back the other way, and then we're looking at further restrictions. I'm trying to keep this controlled enough that further restrictions won't happen. Okay, Representative Yin has a question. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Mosier. Um, would you consider that the, the way that skill-based amusement games became enacted in each of our counties is a little different than the way historic horse racing got enacted in bingo and pull tabs? in the fact that the voters never had a direct say on enabling whether skill-based amusement games were, in, were available in their county or not. Go ahead. Ms. Mr. Chairman, Representative Yen, great question, but they also didn't get a vote on poker or pull tabs or bingo or anything else. Uh, and as I mentioned, with historic horse racing, what they voted on is now currently what we have. Uh, my concern about votes is there's probably, and you can probably think of a few counties, if you hold a vote in those counties, they'd probably ban alcohol. I mean, the voters can, I mean, if you don't do it, you don't care about it. And with strict controls over where those, where it happens, I think it's okay. The other problem I have is slamming the door in existing businesses. Uh, skill games has been key, and I'm not exaggerating, key in the survival of a number of businesses, especially through what we've been through the last three or four years. And I don't want to slam the door in their face, uh, which is what effectively you'd be doing with an opt out. So if we keep it controlled, I think the concerns about it, the concerns I've been hearing about an opt out is people don't want uncontrolled all over the place flashing signs. But I don't think if we could keep it controlled that the county opt out is necessary any more than bingo and pull tabs or Calcutta is. Okay, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Mosier, one other question. How do you feel about truck stops versus liquor establishments? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, Representative Yen, another great question. I, you know, the reason it doesn't really matter to me is truck stops. I could probably count the number of truck stops that would qualify under this on my fingers and toes, and you don't have families wandering around truck stops. They have restricted areas. It's usually in the trucker's lounge. And so if it's a convenience store where you have high school kids coming in on break, no. But with a truck stop, I think it's a specific enough environment that I don't really have a problem as long as it has the definitions that are contained herein because I think it strictly limits the focus on what's doing it. You're not gonna find a group of high school kids going to the truck stop during lunch break, uh, but you do see it at a convenience store. Okay, Senator James has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mosier, do you believe that we're a gambling state? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator James, uh, no, I would consider Nevada a gambling state, maybe Montana. Skill games are gaming, not gambling, hmm. because there is a skill component involved. As mentioned in prior testimony, you could potentially win in every game, and it's not the focus of the business. If we allowed 20 skill games per establishment, Maybe that would change its complexion. Uh, the only real casino-esque look we have is on the reservation or with historic horse racing. Follow up. Go ahead, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. According to the dictionary, definition of gambling, practice or activity of betting, 
practice, or ri practice of risking money or other stakes in a game or bet. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Moser, do uh, you Mr. still believe Chairman, that we're not a gambling state? Senator James, uh, that would be a game of risk, not a game of skill. Game of chance. A game of chance is something. Or in the that dictionary, where a game uh, that's gambling. Our statutes. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, Senator James. Both of you gentlemen, please work through the chairman so we don't get. The I'm back sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator James. Um, statutes a little more detailed than a dictionary definition, but in this world, we talk about games of chance versus games of skill. Uh, so, no, I do not consider Wyoming a gambling state. We have games, but we do not have gambling on a widespread basis, except, as I mentioned, because even a historic... Mr. Chairman, pardon the, pardon the interruption, but yeah, we get ahead. our words from the dictionary to create statute. So, gambling comes from the dictionary, and according to the dictionary, we are a gambling state. Accord that's how our games are set up. You bet and you risk money so we are a gambling state so Ms. mr chairman uh, that is senator, a question don't you agree uh, <laughs> or do you no, that was agree? a statement mr chairman in, in all due okay. respect mr chairman senator james i would prefer to re refer to statute than merriam webster's and we have a delineation between games of skill and games of chance and so okay any further questions members Okay, thank you for thank your you, testimony. Any other members of the public, any folks here would like to visit on this issue? How fast did you drive? Within the safe, within the safe limits, sir. <laughs> I don't think that's in statute. <laughs> that's not in statute. No, uh, uh, good okay. morning. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Members of the committee, Jonathan Downing, uh, appearing on behalf of uh, Cowboy Skill and Pacematic. Also joined by Frank Fina with Pacematic and Cowboy Skill and Catherine Wilkinson. And thank you for uh, taking the time on uh, this subject as well as uh, congratulations on being ahead of schedule. So it's uh, appreciated there. Um, with respect to the bills, um, we'll just cover a couple areas real quick and I'll, I'll turn it over to Catherine for the other pieces, but the, um, with uh, the county opt out as far as 23 LSO 0065 working draft 4.4, 4, um, you've heard from us before on this and also had an email, but uh, would just draw your attention to that. However, uh, on the opt out, um, would just reiterate some of what Mr. Moser had said as far as some of his members, and then would also just cover that um, since 2020 and 21, and also with the special, there have been opportunities to address opting in or opting out. In the meantime, uh, you have seen companies uh, that have made investments based off of what was passed into statute and has been in statute since 2020, even with some of the changes that have occurred throughout that time. Uh, with Pacematic Games, as far as our manufacturer who distributes through, through Cowboy Skill, um, over 90% of the revenues that are uh, generated from those machines typically stay within Wyoming. And that reason why I draw your attention to that is that that's when you dig down into those numbers, that's talking more, and this is after the 20% tax, but uh, that, that, well, that includes part of the tax too. But the, in the meantime, though, it, you have companies that have invested heavily in those areas. Um, with respect to the other bill, I'll turn it over to Catherine for that issue and, and then a couple other areas if, if that works for your schedule. Go ahead, Ms. Wood. She's trying. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you, Catherine Wilkinson, on behalf of Cowboy Skill and Pacematic. Can you hear me better now, Mr. Chairman? Thank you. Um, we would stand in support of the amusement games 
authorized locations. Uh, this is the missing part of the puzzle that we have been asking for since Skill Games to, came to the state and were authorized in 2020. We do believe that there are age appropriate locations for these games of 21 and up and that liquor licenses and truck stops um, are those appropriation appropriate areas in the statute that is the main piece that is missing that we would like to see fixed. So we would reiterate that, uh, that we support that. Uh, we also do stand in support of that amendment to change on page four, uh, line one, to change that date to um, current um, you know, policy decision of where it is, but I, you know, today would be a good date uh, to make sure that those locations are um, appropriate. As it is written right now in the statute, there is no location, and as soon as expansion does hit without definition of where those games can go, the only limiting factors are they have to be available to age 21 and up, the four games per location, and then the um, amount of the max payout and the gameplay limits are set in there. Otherwise, uh, there are no other determining factors and they, the Gaming Commission does not have discretion over where those games can go with the way the statute is currently written. So we would urge you uh, to support that uh, location. With that, Mr. Chairman, we'd stand for any questions you may have. Representative Baker has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've talked a little bit about the net proceeds uh, would your industry be supportive of inserting like a dedicated line item into that formula for facility upgrades? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Baker, uh, with respect to a dedicated line item, could you expand a little bit more? Are you talking about where the proceeds go or um, as um, far as appropriations or otherwise? Mr. Ahead, Chairman, uh, Baker. prior to uh, actually getting that number. So we have a net proceeds number. I'd like to see if you're supportive of inserting a, an expense line item into that net proceeds, which we all kind of understand is a moving calculation, I guess. Um, so would that be something that you guys would be supportive of? If, if giving back to those industries and, and seeing some growth in the and pushing the, the live the live racing a little bit more in our state? Well, I'd, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'd, We'd look at it, that with the client. Um, however, uh, when you look at the contracts, and this varies by skill game company, um, a, a significant portion of uh, what what is earned in those locations goes directly back into that location, and that's for that private business owner to decide how they how they choose to where they put their money and those types of things. But. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may too, um, you know, that is a policy decision where the tax proceeds would go for skill games. As of now, we are not tied to the live horse racing at our all. Our contracts are with the local establishments that they're in. We don't have any uh, tax proceeds that go anything to live horse racing. So the way that our contracts work out is we have our local operators, our vendors, which are a group of eight local vendors here in Wyoming, and they contract, they traditionally run pool tables, dart boards, jukeboxes, traditional entertainment uh, that you would see in establishments. They have a contract to run a skill game in bars or VFWs that they split the proceeds of that. So the locations split that money, but currently with our tax rate, it's 20% of that. Half of it goes to the school foundation account. Half of it goes to the city, town, or county in which the game is played. And then 10% of that goes to the Gaming Commission for revenue. So if you're interested in changing that 20%, we would say that's a policy decision as you want those, where you want those proceeds to go. Representative Baker, follow up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that wasn't my interest. It was um, increasing the portion that the state would, would retain. And, and going back to the history again, uh, you know, the original enacting and legislation was with the idea, in my mind when I voted on it, was to support live horse racing. And you guys have detracted yourself from any obligation of that, and it's just a little bit concerning to me. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, I'm, I'm talking about for, skill games, though. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Oh, Mr. Chairman. I'm oh, sorry, I thought we had a question. We can. Okay. Ahead. Okay, any other questions? Uh, any other comments? Any, um, Mr. Chairman? I think sure. Mr. Fina might have one other comment. Go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Those buttons are there. You go. They're a challenge. Frank Fina with Cowboy Skill and Pacematic, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, I just wanted to comment quickly on an earlier question about the truck stops and uh, the language about 25,000 gallons. That, that, uh, that language, um, I believe, mirrors language that exists in other states that define truck stops. And in other states that for various reasons have defined truck stops, um, they evaluate by simply looking at past history. How many gallons have been pumped from a truck stop over the last uh, three to five years? And they do that, you know, they set up a regulation saying that's how the evaluation will occur. So that's just, just in, to be informative as to where that type of language, I believe, came from. I've just seen it before, yeah. very similar type language in a number of other states. Okay, appreciate that. Okay, anything else? Thank you for, uh, okay, Representative Gray, you have a question or? Uh, Representative Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thanks for that clarification, but that's historical. And so when you look at that line 28, it's projected in, into the future. So you have a truck stop that's just starting up. Who gets to project that? You, I, I, sorry. Mr. Chairman, every, every major truck stop along I-80 has more than 25,000 gallons a year. Um, and you could also verify that with with your what your taxes fuel taxes are being paid on those truck stops um, and so the when you're looking at 25,000 gallons that's that's where they're looking for um, having a significant presence as far as typically if you're doing 25,000 gallons you're also going to have a driver's lounge and and those types of those types of accommodations that you would you wouldn't necessarily find in other locations okay very good representative jennings yeah thank you mr chairman so again, I, as I read that, I, I think about somebody just deciding to put a truck stop between Chugwater and <laughs> yeah, somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. And, and as I read that, it's it's projected. It's a new truck stop. It's they don't know. And so I was just asking, who's going to be the one projecting? Is that dub, is that uh, transportation, or is, who gets to project for the new place? Uh, Mr. Chairman, on a very good, very good question on a new truck stop, absolutely. And and what you would see when you would be talking about the capacity of the tanks that would be on location, um, you'd also be looking at your your distribution types of reports that you might be looking at. And so it, uh, that that is probably something that you want to address when it's a brand new truck stop, though. Okay, Representative Gray, question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, off that, I, I assume it's the Gaming Commission that's going to do the projection. And so, I mean, just from a legislative angle, why, what, what's the upside of having that language? I mean, why wouldn't you just have a new truck stop established that they're meeting the average? Yeah, it would take them a year rather than us have a thing where we're putting the Gaming Commission, that they're going to be in that position. Uh, and who knows how that is, uh, pardon the pun, gamed. Uh, and so it, it just, I, I just trying to look at upside and downside in terms of drafting of the language. And I, I think it's probably, I lean towards taking it out. So just wanted your opinion on it. Thank you. Okay. Go Mr. Ahead. Chairman, Representative Gray, I, I think we could come up with some different language as far as trying to achieve that. Because when you're, when you're talking truck stops and taxes between Department of Revenue and, uh, and the Department of Ag, that's as far as weights and measures and those pieces. Those are areas that probably need some more clarification in this legislation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you all. Any other members of the public like to comment on this topic? morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jeremiah Riemann here on behalf of the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. Uh, I wanted to just offer a, a couple of things. First off, uh, I don't have a formal position for you on uh, either of the bills, but I have met with uh, my revenue committee as well as a number of my uh, members to try and offer uh, some opinions that I think uh, uh, would be reflective of commissioners across the state. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll start with uh, the opt-out uh, conversation. 
I think you've heard me uh, previously state that commissioners as this legislation uh, was being developed uh, or, or this industry was uh, being established through state statute uh, couldn't come to consensus about opt-in, opt-out, uh, but did ask the legislature throughout that interim and during uh, the debate uh, uh, that session for an option. You all didn't uh, take that up uh, and the industry has been established. It's now an important tax contributor uh, in our communities across the state. When I presented this legislation, uh, to uh, my members, none of them indicated that they were supportive. If anything, uh, there was uh, great concern about the animosity that might be uh, built, uh, one with industry uh, who uh, uh, needed this uh, uh, opportunity during the pandemic in particular. Uh, and two, and I'm, you guys can help me maybe keep a scorecard here because I'm gonna throw a bone to our municipalities. Uh, my folks were concerned about the fact that this is an, a county opt-out. Many of these facilities exist in municipalities and it's a contributor to uh, their bottom line uh, and they shared uh, their concerns there. Uh, the other thing that uh, was of concern to commissioners with the way that this particular draft was uh, structured is that it really allows you to opt in, opt out whenever you want to, uh, as long as you take it to the voters and they, they uh, approve that. So we're worried about this yo-yo effect that might exist amongst county commissions that might come into uh, office and, and uh, uh, felt that maybe a more appropriate thing if you're going to advance it is to include some language that there is a time limitation. You see that in many other uh, statutes, whether that's our sales and use tax statutes around votes or or even uh, around uh, the uh, HHR uh, industry of, I think generally about two years before you can take it back out uh, to uh, a vote. So, so they did offer uh, that particular uh, opinion. Moving towards uh, the other legislation, if I've heard anything from my members more recently, it's the need for more local control, both on HHR and uh, around uh, skill games. Uh, if I can just uh, explain very quickly, as it relates to skill games, local communities really have no uh, uh, control uh, over uh, that business activity. That's all structured through the Wyoming Gaming Commission. In the HHR world, uh, it really revolves around two points. One is the opt-in, uh, the vote that would take place with the people. And second, and it's limited to the county commissioners making a decision on the initial location, uh, uh, but we have a more recent uh, court decision that says past that, commissioners have no authority to regulate these uh, facilities. So we've seen some counties begin to say, whoa, hold on, maybe we're not even going to authorize an initial uh, facility because we can't we feel we may be limited uh, in even saying uh, the hours that an operation uh, should exist uh, uh, and maybe some other local controls that they might want to uh, put in place relative to the location. So I have heard my uh, folks say uh, uh, we need to look at this local control uh, issue. I will say I'm working with industry on that. I'm not bringing anything to you today uh, for you to take up. Uh, but it is uh, something that that uh, we may come back to you uh, in the future for uh, uh, an approach uh, that would be uh, favorable. I think in terms of the sideboards uh, that have been presented in the other bill, uh, my commissioners, at least on initial reaction, liked that approach. They are concerned about where some of these place or these uh, machines could go and non-age appropriate uh, locations or at least uh, verification. Uh, but again, that's not a formal position at this point. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll just wrap up my comments there uh, and be happy to take any questions. None. So thank you. Oh, just Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So basically on the opt-in opt-out, you're not 
your members aren't indicating favorably towards that piece of legislation. And then on the uh, other piece with the sideboards, um, they're neutral on that, but uh, m more in favor of that option at this point. Mr. Chairman, Representative Sweeney, I think you're hitting it on the head. Uh, I found nobody that was supportive of the opt uh, out uh, legislation. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned, they found many issues on the other. They seem to be a little bit more favorable towards that particular legislation. Any other? Okay, thank you. Appreciate your testimony this morning. Next. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Nick Agopian. I represent SNC Vending. Um, they are a vendor, and then Bankshot uh, LLC, which is a manufacturer of the skills game software that SNC puts in locations with operators around the state. A lot of a lot of different terms uh, associated. Today, I'm here to offer testimony. First on 23 LSO 0064, then on 23 LSO 0065. In both cases, uh, my client stands in opposition to these bills. First, um, on the skills-based amusement games, my on, on the skills games, amu skill-based amusement games authorized loca locations, it is my clients that would be directly impacted by this legislation. We currently have locations that are not at truck stops, that are not in facilities or at locations that currently have liquor permits. We do have locations. We have successful locations. We have locations that I still, if you recall when we, uh, this committee took this up in Lander at their June meeting, I identified that I still have not heard any complaints. No complaints have been filed about these locations with the, with the Gaming Commission, I haven't heard the Commission come forward. I haven't heard anybody come forward as it relates uh, to specific issues related to the placement of these skill-based amusement games in establishments that are not truck stops and establishments that are not liquor licenses. And to that end, passage of this legislation, for, in, in my view, defines who the customer is and the potential for other new locations across Wyoming, in Wyoming businesses. There's been a lot of discussion that skill-based amusement games are an add-on. In many instances, and I think the numbers show, the vast majority of those locations are in bars. And there's a, there are a handful and there's potential for additional locations with current operators that don't have those, uh, don't either qualify as, as out, outlined in this bill. So we stand in direct opposition to this as, as we are the party that is negatively impacted. Now there is grandfathering in there. Now that grandfathering is for those existing locations. There's discussion about the timing as it relates to rules. Because of rules, because we don't have rules, the state of play, the state of the industry, the skills-based skills, skills -based amusement game industry in Wyoming is currently shrinking. It's, on, I believe, on that revenue chart in front of you that the revenue has, has dropped. Um, because we don't have rules, new locations cannot be uh, brought on. So games that were originally licensed under the current statute, if the business, loc the business where the location is changes hands, the new owner has to go through the permitting process to be a new approved owner and have the background checks. So we can't move our games that are currently legal in the state today. And so, as the committee's heard, skill-based amusement games is paying a 20% tax rate across the state. That is a very high number. It's showing the revenue um, that was out identified by the Gaming Commission shows skills-based amusement game paying a very fair share of that revenue that's coming to the state. <clears throat> you know, in, in, in my opinion, action that this bill proposes ultimately picks winners and losers and avoids the scenario of a capitalist marketplace where we have the opportunity to go out and find those locations. I think there's been some mention about some saturation number. There probably is. But generally speaking, we'd like the opportunity to go out into the marketplace and determine what that is and have the opportunity to put those put additional games in additional locations. The grandfathering 
clauses there for additional ones, but I would ask you, would this committee, as you're thinking about moving this bill and moving it forward, would you consider a payout of those games? The state has the numbers on a weekly basis of what those machines are making to determine the 20% that's, that, that's paid on a weekly basis to the state. Would you consider a payout at some point for these machines? Because there's a lot, you know, and so I, I would throw that out there as something to think about. Is it likely? I don't know. Um, for that, I'd stand for any questions on 64. If not, I would, I would just go briefly uh, to 65. It does not seem to me that there's a significant level of support for 65 if, from what I just heard. Again, um, I would look at this and, and I just, I, I don't see it as a likely scenario. The revenue is going to the locals. And so the risk of seeing this go back out for an opt out, I don't, I, I don't know if that's a like, likely thing to occur, but certainly I'd be wondering if this committee would consider something that we've considered in the past as it relates to oil and gas revenues. When local communities um, look at opting out of oil and gas development, one of the things that's been discussed is should they still benefit from the revenue? With money coming out of skill-based amusement games going to their local communities, you know, is there their potential to deduct the lost revenue that they've declined to, to collect through businesses and deduct that from any state entitlement that that local community would, would be entitled to? That too may be a little too far-fetched. I, I, I could see that, but it's certainly something to consider. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd stand for any questions, and I would urge this committee um, certainly uh, to, to vote down this or to extend it out for some more discussions at a, at a later date. Okay, Representative Sweeney has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Nick, for, for those comments. Do you have a sense um, with, with the companies you represent, um, how many locations we're talking about um, you know, that might be, I, I, I don't know what those locations are, but non liquor or non, uh, truck stop. I would have to get greater, Mr. Chairman, Representative Sweeney. It's my understanding that there is one or two laundromat facilities and a handful of C store locations that don't have fueling options are, are the locations. And I could certainly um, find out a little more detail. I did not, that, that's my understanding of it today. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. So um, thanks for that. So maybe eight or 10 locations that wouldn't qualify under 64. Forgive me, Mr. Chairman. I believe the number is like six or seven locations. So that could be up to, you know, um, 24, 28 terminals so, so okay. as a percentage it's it, it's it's the minority percentage of, of, of our locations okay okay thank you any other questions okay thank you thank you any other folks here would like to comment testify do we have anybody online as well wants to testify on this no no okay good well, not good, but okay. So I know what we got here is in this room. Okay, very good. Glad you cleared that up. Well, I, this sort of helps me focus here. Okay. Mr. Come Chairman, on. I'm Bob McLaurin with the Wyoming Association of Municipalities. Uh, I want to comment on the opt out provision. I uh, would agree with uh, Mr. Riemann that uh, the cities and towns ought to have the opportunity to opt out. It shouldn't be just a county decision. Um, because if there's trouble in one of these establishments, it's going to be the local police force that responds. But appreciate your consideration on that. You got any questions? questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public here would like to come testify on this topic? Okay. Okay, members. Are there any questions about any of the materials? Staff can answer or any of those things. Representative Gray, go ahead. Yeah, the commission, if you could come on up, Commissioner Moore, that'd be great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Gray. Thank yeah. you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Moore. 
want to ask a little bit about page four on Bill Draft 64 and this proposed amendment on moving the uh, this grandfathering to July 1st of this year rather than April 1st of next year. If we didn't change it to your suggested amendment, what does that look like? I mean, is it the kind of thing that if you see an influx, which I'm sure we would see, uh, would you have a vigorous process and maybe control the amount coming in or anybody that got in their, their application on March 31st, would it be a processing thing where if they date their application March 31st, it's definitely, it will be granted as long as they meet the check boxes and that, that you've allocated. I mean, how, what does that look like? I mean, what's your discretion if we don't move the, uh, the grandfathering back? And then I have a question for LSO on the grandfathering, but but I think the first one's more directed at you. Okay, go ahead, Director. Chairman Harshman, Representative Gray, you know, our discretion is minimal. So, you know, as far as that goes, when an application comes in, 60 day clock starts once the application is completed. So we have 60 days to either grant, deny an application. So, the scenario that I look at is, is you know, and, and in my submission to you, I made this the statement, you know, is, is this your intent to allow people that are, <clears throat> that submit in March and decide they see that they're gonna be restricted and go outside those bounds to get, get locations filled with skill-based amusement games, knowing that they've got you know, they may not even be up and running. They may be authorized, but they're not up and running until even after the date. So we're currently promulgating rules. Once those rules are completed, with the April 1st of, of next year date you have in there, there's gonna be a window of opportunity for those applications to come in. And we're gonna have additional applications coming in as well bear in mind um, that are going to be people are going to be proactive there's a lot of people waiting to expand into the state and expand into the, the skill-based amusement mm -hmm. games so again i think more directly to your your question i apologize when an application comes in we stamp it and then we immediately are reviewing it for completion once we have, we know that we have a completed application, if it comes in the door and it is fully completed and the submission is complete, that's the date when that 60 day um, clock starts. And so then we review it and either approve it or deny it, check the boxes as you said, or, or don't check the boxes. So I do see it as problematic. And again, it's, the the intent of of the grandfathering are you wanting to grandfather in these folks that have been sitting here waiting the 14 vendors 286 operators with 830 games um, that have been in play since day one i have a couple follow-ups thank you mr chairman if it's 60 days then First, my first follow up is, do you agree? I mean, the way I read this is in theory, right? If it, you're the real date, you would have the discretion if someone submitted something February 2nd to say it hasn't hit the 60 days. And therefore, I mean, the way it reads, you have to have the permit, the authorization on April 1st. So really, anything after February 1st, in theory, the, the Gaming Commission could have the discretion. I'm not saying you would use this, but you could uh, say we are our, our actual we're not going to do anything that was submitted after February 1st um, and the way I read the statute that would probably be allowed do you agree with that interpretation I think at this point I'd have to look at it in that light and I apologize for that I, I can't answer that question at this time okay um, and then my other follow-up mr. chairman is is your interpretation of the statute would be that they would have to have the stamp that it's been submitted by April 1st or that you've actually approved it by April 1st because my view it's the second Go ahead, and I, I'm sorry and, and again I apologize chairman Harshman for, going, for directly good. responding to him chairman Harshman representative gray um, and that in itself 
what you're saying is if we have an April first date, so March 29th, someone walks in the door with a completed application, and we've had that happen the day before, have all their money, have everything, boom, it made that date if it's approved, and then we go through that and do this. Did that answer your question? I, Mr. Chairman, Go ahead. follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But it really isn't approved. I mean, it says any operator that has a skill based amusement game before April 1st, 2023, correct? So, I mean, they don't have it when you stamp their application for completeness. They only have it once you've approved it. And I'm just trying to understand in the language. I mean, I, but do you agree? Chairman Harshman, yeah. Representative Gray, I, I'd have to. Uh, get with our council and let them inter um, interpret that and get back with you. <laughs> Members, any other questions? Any? Okay, committee, we have two. Yeah, go ahead. Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Anderson, we, I, I think a lot of times in statute, we've had grandfatherings where it's before the enactment. I just want to make sure for constitutional purposes, you know, federally and state, that it's the view that that is constitutional and that there's some precedent there. Go ahead, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, if that's the direction of the committee, I'll certainly look into that. Um, you know, in general, it's drafted the way it was as the date of the effective date, just to avoid those concerns. Um, but as you know, there have been occasions where we've we've gone back uh, before the effective date. Um, so I'll certainly look into that. If that's the direction this committee takes, and, and bring any concerns to the next meeting. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other questions, Representative Sweeney? Follow up to that, uh, Josh, um, this amendment uh, was Wyoming Gaming Commission letterhead. So I'm, I'm assuming uh, their, their counsel in the AG's office uh, would have reviewed, reviewed that. Would that be your understanding? Go ahead, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I would not be able to, to speak to, to that. Uh, certainly, I hadn't seen it uh, before this morning, and so mm -hmm. I, I hadn't have, haven't had a chance to think about it too much, but uh, whether uh, they did or not, I don't know. Okay, very good. And we could certainly have the commission director Moore, why don't you come back on up here and just maybe where you know what issue we're talking about here. And so maybe if you want to comment on that. I think, I think uh, Chairman Harshman, I, I think I do understand the issue and the concerns you have. Um, the AG's office has not had an opportunity to review this bill um, closely at this point. Um, we will look at that in the next few days and can get a memo to you. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, any other questions? What's the committee's pleasure? Let's first, uh, okay, so we'll talk about uh, House Bill 64, draft point four. I have a motion to move the bill in a, by, uh, by Senator Baldwin and seconded by Senator Schuler. So we have uh, House Bill proposed working draft 23 LSO 64 version point four on the table. Okay, so we're going to work this bill page by page, members. So any amendments on page one? Okay. Page two. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Yen. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make an amendment to remove truck stops um, and would hopefully have a second for discussion, but it would be page two, line five, strike that operates as a truck stop or, and then remove lines 21 through 28, and on page three, lines one through nine. Okay, is there a second to that amendment? 
Representative Baker has seconded that amendment. So go ahead and explain that a little more. Sure, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I don't think I've been shy about uh, what, how I feel about the expansion of skill-based amusement games. I think that limiting it to places that are licensed and permitted to sell alcohol, liquor, or malt beverages is perfectly uh, fine. I don't think we also need it to expand it to truck stops. It is something that did fail on the floor of the house. Um, and I, I, I think we've seen in the Gaming Commission's activity reports that while the tax revenue is good on skill-based amusement games, it does indicate that our citizens lose more money in skill-based amusement games than they do in the other games. Because otherwise, frankly, because we tried to even it out, our tax revenue would be greater in the other ones if our citizens actually lost more in the other ones. Um, so all of that saying, why not just keep it to, to malt liquor and uh, liquor and remove the truck stop language from the bill? Okay, any members for discussion? I'm gonna look to my left, working down. Any members, Representative Sweeney? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I, I think limiting it to just alcohol establishments, truck stops by their nature, in my opinion, are a different beast, not your typical convenience store. Um, and um, my understanding on Interstate 80 in particular, during a major snow event, um, you, you will see uh, huge peaks at truck stops because those drivers don't have any place they can go, anything to do. Um, and um, my understanding is they're a nice entertainment piece uh, for, for the truckers. Um, and the concerns, um, I've had concerns voiced to me about uh, one certain truck stop, but I think, um, uh, down in Douglas, and I think those concerns can be taken easily taken care of with some of the other things that we've tried to put in place as far as separation um, access to people, uh, folks under 21. Uh, so um, I, I would speak in opposition of the amendment. Okay, any other members, any comments? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, I own a company that has a liquor license and I feel like this kind of frames up, you know, that um, have a bit of a conflict on this actual motion. I don't think I have a conflict on the bill, but I just want to explain to the public that I don't think I should vote on this motion, which essentially just carves it out for liquor. Um, but I, I have a question about, it's been in the back of mind and I should have asked it earlier, but in terms of regulating how those machines are located at truck stops, I've heard people say things like it'll be in the driver's lounge, or, you know, but there's nothing in the bill that kind of indicates that level of regulation. I, I mean, I, I do realize that, uh, the gaming commission would have authority here and, and on, but uh, I'm trying to think what the truck stocks look like uh, that have gaming machines. And, um, I have a vision of that in my mind, um, and maybe other people do, but I'm sorry, I'm not trying to get us off track, but I'm just trying to think about what that really means. And I will have a conflict on uh, Representative Yen's motion. It's not prejudicial in any way, but I just don't want to think I should. Okay. Very good, any other comments? <laughs> Since you're ready to vote on the motion to remove truck stops, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. I think that motion has failed. Okay, no call for division. Okay, any other, we're on page two now. Mr. Chairman. Representative Yen. I'll make another motion, okay. and that is to remove the projected projection part and only rely on defining a truck stop by its existing sales. So I believe that would be striking on page two, line 28, or that is projected to sell on average 
of 25,000 gallons. Um, and then on page three, strike lines one through three, except for the semicolon and and. And that, that way, if there is a new truck stop for whatever reason, they have to prove that they're eligible for it within a year, and then they'd be eligible for it based on their previous sales rather than our projected sales. Very good. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Gray. Okay, discussion. Thank you all. Oh, Representative Sweeney. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I speak against that in only in the sense of caution. So um, I, I think um, if you don't leave some qualifying manner in there, whether it's an old truck stop or a new truck stop, and certainly I'm not an expert, but I think you could open up to every um, convenience store um, possible. Um, it would be my take on that. Um, and I, I worry um, there are some convenience stores that aren't necessarily viewed as a truck stop. Um, and I can think of... Mr. Chairman, I think you might be misunderstanding something here. Mr. Co Chair, okay. uh, if I could just maybe save us some time. Okay. I think he's removing the projection. So you, but he's leaving the requirement that it be historical sales of twenty five thousand. So it's not going into small uh, gasoline stations, but it is saying there's no means to uh, have a projection. You have to have the historical sales. I, th I think that's the gist of his motion. That's correct. Okay, okay. Representative I, Sweeney. Thank, thank you. And for that clarification, so and how how would a new truck stop have a historical sales? Okay, Representative Ian, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, thank you. So a new truck stop wouldn't have historical sales. They would have to have a year worth of sales where they sell, on average, 25,000 gallons of diesel or biodiesel fuel a month. So they have to prove that they're eligible as a truck stop instead of only being projected to be eligible as a truck stop, essentially. Ken. Okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, just oh, Senator Schuler is next. He's got a question. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, for clarifications uh, on that particular amendment, could you repeat that again? Go ahead, Representative Ian. Mr. Chairman, thank you. On page two, strike on line 28, the new language, or that is projected to sell on average. And on page three, remove lines one through three uh, and keep the, except for the the semicolon and the and on line three. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to the motion, but I think we have to have a way to provide for plan businesses that come in and build a new facility and, and let them incorporate uh, this segment of their business in their their plans for a new facility. And, you know, I'm, I don't know anything about this area, but it seems to me that there are very big truck stops and there are little gas stations. And, and you know, like if you look around Casper, um, if I could use proper names, like Ghost Town is kind of a smallish truck stop, I think. But out there at Hat 6, I think that's the location. That's a, that's a big place. And so if they were coming in and they had those plans, I'm, I would be really confident they would be a big truck stop. And I don't see why you would exclude them necessarily. And I realize I'm, you know, there might be another way, uh, or we could allow um, the commission to just handle this in a way. Uh, or you could do it by pumps, you could do it by square footage, you could do it by, um, it seems like you have to figure out a way to allow an entrepreneur who wants to build a new facility and wants to incorporate this as a business model to do so. So I, I don't know, I'm throwing that out there. Okay, thank you. Any other? Representative Yen and then Representative Gray. Mr. Chairman, so I think ultimately um, I, I'm, I would be interested in, if, in seeing if there are other solutions to that. I think the current thought of basing it on projection, especially for a new truck stop, um, is kind of a, uh, uh, whoever gets to decide that projection has the decision-making authority, frankly, because you can't, I don't think you would be able to accurately predict how many gallons 
um, if you have no previous data to work on. So if there are other ideas on how to indicate that for a new truck stop, I'm open to it. Um, I think a one year waiting period before you put in a skill based amusement game is fine as long as you after that one year you've proved you're a truck stop. I think that's great. Um, so thank you. Okay, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm supportive of this motion. I, I think that having it be established, I think, is a good thing. And if, if the intent of this bill is to tighten things up, then we should tighten it up across the board. And, and providing this kind of discretion is what, with one mistake, could allow it to enter convenience stores. And as we've seen, it's very difficult to roll back once it's been established. So if we're going to have clean statutes, I think we should just say that they have to establish it over a year. I really don't think when they finance these things that one year of not having skill games in your truck stop is going to prevent them from doing the project. I don't think the financiers doing it, removing that revenue is going to mean the red lights on the project. I mean, I think it just means they got to establish that they're indeed a truck stop uh, with a bright line and then they're going to have it and and uh, they can put that in their in their projections and I think it'll everything will be fine. So I think we should just make it clean and I, I'm for this. Uh, amendment. Thank yeah, you. I think Senator James next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, since we're already a gambling state, I don't see the difference in uh, letting the uh, businesses apply for a temporary permits, and then once they get that twenty-five thousand gallon uh, threshold, then they can get that permanent license, and then if they don't hit that uh, threshold then they that temporary permit goes away until they actually do hit that 25,000 gallon threshold. I think if something like that was put into place, that would solve that issue. But they can initially have it until that's, that's hit. But I think that would solve that problem, that would allow that skill games to come in there and that revenue to start coming in, not only to that business, but to the state. And I think that, solve that issue right there. Just before we do the question. Go chair. Um, you know, I sitting here thinking, I really don't know what, how big a truck stop 25,000 is. I, I really have no idea. I'm thinking a truck, just thinking about that. This is just their diesel sales only. And that, um, you know, they must haul a two, 300 gallons, I would imagine. And so it wouldn't take, it'd take maybe three trucks a day filling up to do a thousand gallons. So this may not even be big enough if we're trying to get the big truck stops. I'm just pointing that out to you. So um, it may be that my comparison with a name brand, it may be a pretty small place that sells 25,000 when you think it through. So we might be careful about that. I'm done. <laughs> okay, any other comments? Okay, generally we don't, uh, we're in the middle of this bill, so. But he said official. But uh, I could, yeah, I'll go ahead. If you have a comment on this, uh, for us. He is as president of the Gaming Commission. I think that is appropriate, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, go Chairman ahead Harris, turn your Harshman? mic on. I think it's on. Oh, it is, okay, okay. very good. Uh, to address what Senator Case has said, We've got dirt contractors in our town that use probably 25,000 gallons of fuel a week. So would they be eligible for, for games of skill there? And then the other thing that I'd like to point out is, uh, you know, we have lottery machines and now coming on to Kino as presented by the Liquor Commission. So those are legal forms of gaming, correct? So why are you trying to, um, I guess, handicap the games of skill from entering into that when they're already approved at truck stops? And then the other point I'd like to point out is that uh, Representative Sweeney down there, if you've got 2,000 trucks sitting at a truck stop and you're only dealing with four machines, it's going to be pretty tough to get your time in on a machine. So. Those are just my comments yeah. on that. So thank you, President. Appreciate your service. Ah, uh, thank you. Okay. 
Any other comments on this amendment now to remove the projection language is what we're talking about. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. Okay. I, I, uh, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. All those in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That, all those opposed? Okay. That motion has been adopted. Okay. Any other motions as we move from page two to page three? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mr. Co-Chair. That 25,000 is a really small number when you think this through. And if you're trying to get it to the big truck stops on I-80, I don't know what that number is, but it's much bigger than this. So um, I can't tell you, I don't know enough about this. If Mark Larson were here representing his clients. Uh, who's got his, you've got his book, right? You, um, Mr. Downing knows that. I, I mean, I have a specific question. Um, I don't think that's a very big gas station, diesel station. And I think it should be a higher limit. You have a motion or? I have no idea, but I'd like to throw a Hail Mary to see if Mr. Downing could weigh in on this. And, and, and I know that's irregular, but, yeah. but it, I don't know anything about the gas business. <laughs> okay, we'll let you do that. Let's go ahead. Mr. Please. Chairman, uh, putting on my Colorado Wyoming Petroleum Marketers hat, Jonathan Downing, I phoned a friend. Um, he informed me that most major truck stops typically average 100,000 gallons of diesel sales annually. So, I mean, 100,000 a month as far as for diesel sales. It's so over a so million, that, Mr. That's Chairman. more of your I-80 truck stops and some of the others on 25 and 90. Yes. And now I'm checking if he's texting me anything. He said 75,000 would actually probably be a better number. So. Okay, thank so, you. So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Go -chair. thank you so much for that. And I would make this a million gallons. Yes. That would be my motion. A year. Mr. Chairman. Sir, uh, yeah, Josh uh, Anderson, uh, just, go ahead. This uh, just to a, note that the current bill is drafted at a, at a monthly month. number, so. Oh, I'm sorry. So it'd be uh, $100,000 100, a month. Is there a second? Second. Second by Representative Yen. Any discussion? Any motions to the motion? <laughs> no. Representative Senator James. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Ahead, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So by doing this, this would reduce the amount of revenue the state would be getting, correct? And we are the revenue committee tasked with bringing in more revenue to the state, correct? Isn't that counterproductive, Mr. Chairman? Thank you. Okay, any other members? Representative Sweeney. I'll be in no vote because I think 100,000 is too much. Okay, so. any other members? Okay, the motion is to move that 25,000 a month to 100,000. All those in favor, just raise your hand. Two, three, four, four. All those opposed? That motion has failed. Counts eight hands there. Okay, any other motions on page two? 50,000. So Senator Case has a motion of 50,000. Is there a second? Second. By Representative Yen, I think we are well aware of this. Any, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Sweet all those spot. opposed. <laughs> okay, that motion has been adopted. Now we're still moving off of page two onto page three. I don't think he'll do it. Okay, moving on to page. There's a young fellow trying to get your attention, but you can. Or he, he doesn't have an official badge. Uh -huh. uh. Okay, so that is fifty thousand. Moving, page three. Now we're moving on to page four. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Representative Yin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On page four, line one, I'll change. I'll move to change April first, twenty twenty-three, to September fourteenth. 2022 and ask for a second say the date again today today, today september 14th 2022 mr chairman you can't you can't do that we can say effective immediately 
So, Mr. Chairman, if I have a second. Mr. Chairman, do we have a second? It. Do we have a second? I'll second it so it can be discussed. Okay, seconded for discussion. Representative Yen. Mr. Chairman, so I, this was Representative Gray's question of whether it would be constitutional uh, to have this backdated date, um, even though this is the amendment that the Wyoming Gaming Commission asked for. I think that if we sponsor it, we need to make sure that we deal with this date when it comes to the session. Um, and having this date earlier now, at least we'll have the information needed to deal with its constitutionality of the date when it comes into session. So. This way we change it now, it's marked. We know that we're gonna to have to deal with it in some way. See any discussion, Mr. Co-Chair? Mr. Chairman, so you're kind of thinking that probably we really can't do this, but we're kind of marking our territory a little bit, saying now. I mean, it, it's a reasonable approach to telegraph what we're doing. I guess that's what you're saying. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Ian? thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's also important to signal to businesses that we don't want you to try to put more toes in the door than you already have. Um, so yes, I think it's a good signal um, just to ensure. Okay, so we have a motion and second. Any further discussion, Representative Gray? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm a little confused. I wanna make sure that I understand what's going on here. I thought someone was gonna move the amendment, but I think Representative Yen did something differently. He, he changed the effective date to immediately. Is that what the, what the amendment is or? No, uh, Mr. Chair, okay. and that's a good question. And I think the amendment is on line one. Is that correct? I, I think okay. That's a better place. Mr. Chairman, that is the amendment that I made. Page four, line one. Not the effective date, but the, the grandfather date. Okay, so we're all clear on that. It's good. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor of that amendment, please raise your hand. Today's date. Today's date. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All those opposed? One, two, three, that motion has been adopted. Okay, any further motions on working draft 64? Seeing none, if we could just call the roll on this. Senator Baldwin. Aye. Senator James. Aye. Senator Pappas. Aye. Senator Schuler. Aye. Representative Baker. No. Representative Gray. Aye. Representative Hallinan? Aye. Representative Henderson? Excuse? Said he's on internet. Is he on my, yeah. He's not online. Representative Jennings? Aye. Representative Roscoe? Aye. Representative Sweeney? Aye. Representative Yen? Aye. Co Chairman Case? Aye. Chairman Harshman? Aye. That passes. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Co-Chair. I would like to suggest and make a motion that we take the other bill, the opt-in, opt-out bill, and that we carry it over to our next meeting with instructions to staff to add a municipal uh, piece to that. Okay, I, I, I think that's a great idea, Mr. Co-Chair. So without objection, committee will just do that and we'll continue working on it. And yeah or okay i don't know if that's sustained by majority i'm not seeing it i think we'll move that forward and just keep working that concept with municipal piece in there and uh delay the inevitable perhaps in that bill okay we're um we're we're at lunchtime we're right on time actually and so uh, our our agenda says 1.30, I believe, 1.30 for uh, 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline funding. Okay, so the committee will stand at ease until 1.30. Thank you all for your work.